Good evening and welcome to tonight's special city council meeting, Monday, February 12th. Uh, I will first uh, await a motion to leave the non-public session and to seal the minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Um, I'm going to uh, hand it over to uh, attorney uh, Peter Lachlan in a moment uh, for a uh, reading of the rules of the proceeding. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Peter for those of you who do not know uh, attorney Lachlan. Uh, after serving as Portsmouth City Attorney for seven years, Peter established a private practice focused on municipal law. He has served as town council or special town council to over city, 60 cities and towns throughout New Hampshire. Attorney Lachlan is the author of four volumes of the New Hampshire Practice Series published by Lexis Publishing. These volumes contain over 120 chapters providing in-depth treatment of the law on topics ranging from abatements to elections to roads to taxation to zoning. His body of work has been cited over 40 times in New Hampshire Supreme Court cases He's a graduate of Merrimack College with a BA in History and the University of Notre Dame Law School. Uh, thank you very much, Peter, for agreeing to be our counsel this evening. So we have a few, the rules. Uh, we have on the agenda the adoption of the rules for the prece uh, proceeding. So. So we're going to, what the plan is to, uh, to be, uh, anybody that wishes to speak tonight uh, under the rules are going to be sworn in. And rather than everybody come up individually, um, when the, uh, uh, second, the city clerk will have everybody who's interested in speaking raise their hand, and that will save some time. And um, uh, then after that, um, the, we have the presentations and the introduction of the parties uh, the, 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 which will occur um, uh, before anything else starts. Uh, City Council uh, will be asking questions. Uh, oh, okay, there will be public comment. Under the rules, we're basically adopt, working under the rules of um, Chapter 43 of the statutes, and that allows for pub public comment. Uh, but anybody has something to say on this particular matter that's being heard tonight? Um, uh, when, the, when it comes to public comment, there'll be uh, the timer that um, uh, is normally used for three minutes, but the, the um, attorneys uh, making the presentation will have uh, a longer period of time. I think that's been, uh, there'd be a 20 minute limit for the initial statement by Council for the City and Council for uh, Mr. Hewitt, and then we'll start a presentation by the City Attorney, a presentation by, for Mr. Hewitt. Um, then there'll be public comment, and then uh, final comments uh, by Council for Mr. Hewitt and Council for the City, um, and then the City Council deliberations. Thank you, Attorney Lachlan. Um, we need a copy of the, uh, or first we need the uh, the swearing in of all witnesses if we rise for yes. uh, city clerk. Okay. Anybody who's going to speak in the public would need to stand to take this oath. Okay. Um, I do solemnly swear and state your name. That the testimony I am about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, upon the pains and penalties of perjury. Thank you. Can I have a copy of the charge? confirm 
Attorney Lachlan, the reading of the charge, I'll read this entire memorandum. I, I don't know that that's necessary. Um, I, I, you I, stipulate I, that it's part of the record already? Yeah, I think you can, we can agree to waive the reading at this time. Okay. We will uh, we'll enter into the record uh, the, the charge brought uh, forth uh, that is in the council packet, uh, which we've had a chance to review. All right. Uh, next is the introduction of the parties uh, for the record. So I'll start. Mr. Mayor, Susan Morrill, City Attorney for Portsmouth, and I have here with me Trevor McCourt, who's our Deputy City Attorney, and um, Cynthia Ravel, our Administrative Assistant. Mr. Mayor, Jeremy Eggleton with the law firm of Orr and Reno. On behalf of Mr. Hewitt, I'm joined by Mr. Hewitt here at the table. Thank you. We will now move on to initial statements. Oh, we got one. Oh, with the trait, uh, Councillor Denton. Thank you, Your Honor. So everyone here is aware I recused myself from the non-public meeting, and I will be recusing myself tonight from this hearing due to um, potentially having biased myself in this matter uh, due to a response which I gave to a question and answer in the Portsmouth Herald this past election. I'm going to go ahead and read the question and then read the answer in its entirety. But just so everyone knows what to listen for is I specifically talk about the Rains Avenue project, which is one of the charges here. And the recusal goes to the crux of the issue at hand when it comes to quasi-judicial bodies. So again, I'm just going to read the question and the response from the Herald. And I spoke with Attorney Lachlan about this earlier this afternoon. And um, we agree this is the best path for me to take. Should the council address the pace and type of development in the city? If yes, how? My response, the current and prior city council's different approaches to address the development in the starkest example is the starkest example of why Portsmouth cannot afford to go backwards. Policy is set by passing ordinances, like how four years ago my climate change focus pushed enacting the floodplain district zoning ordinance before any North Mill Pond development was submitted. By contrast, instead of passing zoning ordinances, the prior city council harassed our talented staff that simply enforces existing ordinances, resulting in the deputy city manager, planning director, and traffic engineer all quitting in an unprecedented loss of institutional knowledge. Additionally, the prior city council risked even more lawsuits than the ones they created by replacing our quasi-judicial board volunteers with ones that implied they would not abide by existing zoning. Regardless of how you feel about the large mixed North Mill Pond development on Rains Avenue, city taxpayers are on the hook for a lawsuit over three planning board members that former Mayor Beck said appointed in his final weeks, potentially granting in bad faith the rehearing of the project's approvals after deadline passed. To save taxpayers money, development must be addressed through policy as the current city council has done by rezoning the remaining large underdeveloped properties downtown, like the recently purchased Citizens Bank, so any redevelopment meet the new affordable housing, open space, and density requirements. Again, I just read that in its entirety. It goes to specifically one of the charges here and to the crux of the issue. So with that said, I will excuse myself. Councilor Denton. I I just want to point out, Councilor Denton called me today and asked my opinion, and I, what it was based on is, first of all, we know that, and it will come up tonight, that the, the, the standard by what any of these hearings are held uh, is, comes out of the Constitution, uh, New Hampshire Constitution. It is the right of every citizen to be tried by judges as impartial as a lot of humanity will admit. And couple cases. It was a case in 1982 in case of appeal of Lathrop. And the court stated, it is a well-established legal principle that a distinction must be made between preconceived point of view about certain principles of law or prejudgment concerning issues of fact in a particular case. There is no doubt that the latter, meaning prejudgment concerning facts, 
would constitute grounds for disqualification. And then another case is um, Lorenz versus New Hampshire Administrative Courts, uh, 19, a 2004 case. And the court said, whether an appearance of impropriety exists is determined under an objective standard. That is, would a reasonable person, not the judge himself, in question, not the judge himself, question the impartiality of the court? The test for the appearance of partiality is an objective one. That is, whether an objective, disinterested observer, fully informed of the facts, would entertain significant doubt that justice would be done in this case. And I discussed with uh, Counselor that I think it would fair, be fair to say that based on that comment um, that um, Mr. Hewitt would have a basis for um, questioning whether he would, um, whether there would be doubt that justice would be done in this case and that the appropriate thing was for him to, to um, re, um, recuse himself. Uh, let the record reflect that we're talking about Counselor Denton and not Mr. Hewitt. That's correct. I'm I saying do. Mr. C Mr. Hewitt would have a basis to, to question whether he would be getting a fair hearing if I Counselor see. Denton said. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Attorney Lachlan. Uh, now for the introduction of the parties for the record. Done. I think we did oh, that. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> statements by counsel now. Okay. okay. The amount of time is 15 minutes, I believe. So good evening, um, City Council, Mayor. Attorney Lachlan, um, the matter before you tonight is whether Mr. Hewitt, a planning board member, has committed malfeasance and whether he should be removed from the planning board. So malfeasance simply means the general misuse of one's office, of a public office, or as a wrongful conduct that affects, interrupts, or interferes with the performance of official duties, or as the doing of an act that ought not to be done. Such acts do not need to be criminal in nature. The acts of malfeasance or wrongful acts alleged in this matter are violations of the legal restraints placed upon our planning board members, all land use board members, to act in conformity with not only the right to know law, but also with a quasi-judicial standard and the juror standard to remain fair and impartial in the matters that they hear coming before their board. So a planning board member, as you know, has really two roles. There is a legislative role um, in regards to zoning ordinances, the master plan, et cetera. But when applications come before the board, they sit in a unique role, considered a quasi-judicial role or basically a citizen judge or juror. Um, they're obviously not actual judges, but under the law, their conduct is given the same restrictions and guidelines. So similar to a judge or a jury, a planning board um, should, member should be acting fair and impartial. In putting this in another context that perhaps more people are familiar with, if you were a party to a lawsuit or accused of a crime, you would want your case to be heard by a fair and impartial judge and a fair and impartial jury. It's the same for all of your citizens, property owners who come before the planning board with applications seeking permission to change the use of their property or develop their property, they have rights enshrined in our Constitution, uh, property rights, and um, they have the right to appear before board and board members who are fair and impartial, who will hear the facts and apply the law fairly like any judge. 
That's what New Hampshire law requires of our land use board members. So the guidelines for that fairness and impartiality are called the juror standard. It's not complicated. Um, when you sit and think about it, it's the same standard that's used in every courtroom every day across this country. Jurors are everyday citizens. They come from every walk of life, every educational background, age, socioeconomic status, and they sit on civil jury trials every day, grand juries and criminal trials. The court, the judges in those cases, give them instructions on how to conduct themselves and what's expected of them. If you've ever been selected for a jury, uh, you know that the initial screening uh, of jurors involves the court asking a, a number of questions, all designed to determine if you qualify, if you can be fair and impartial. Many of those relate to whether you know the parties um, in the case. Could you treat them fairly or do you have a conflict? Or whether you know anything about the case, have you heard anything about the case, have you read anything about the case, or um, have you done any research about the case, essentially are you biased? If you answer yes to any of those questions, you would be disqualified from sitting as a juror. Um, because a juror must decide a case based upon the facts presented in the courtroom using the law provided by the judge. And this is the same standard that applies to all land use board members. There are some statutory exceptions to this where jurors are not allowed to go to crime scenes. Planning board members can go out and view property by statute. But there are very minor um, differences between the two. So many times in a jury selection, a juror might say they've heard something about the case in the media, but they think they can still sit and hear the evidence as before them and be impartial. And in such a case, if the juror says that they can be impartial, the judge would allow them to sit. However, in other cases, jurors say, I have such strong opinions about this. I've experienced this type of event in my own life or a family members experience this type of event, and I cannot set that aside. I, I don't think I can be fair and impartial, in which case those strong opinions would preclude that person from sitting as a juror. So that's just a different context in which to think about these words we're throwing around tonight using a lot in the memos of law, using in the charging document and through the testimony you're going to hear juror standard, quasi-judicial role, and um, there's a different context for you to help um, put that in. And we're here tonight not because of one instance of conduct that perhaps could be construed as a mistake or an error. The matter that you're going to hear about tonight, it's about a long course of conduct of numerous actions that demonstrate some bias and prejudgment of projects coming before the planning board. Those that violated the juror standard and many of these prior actions were brought to Mr. Hewitt's attention. Corrective action was attempted by various people. He was counseled by my predecessor. He was um, counseled by the chairperson of the planning board. He was trained by the New Hampshire Municipal Association um, all throughout this first two years of his tenure on the planning board. However, his conduct continued to stray outside of the bounds of that legal restriction and the guidelines on his behavior as a planning board. And the risk of that conduct, so if, if a, a juror needed to be disqualified, there perhaps would be a mistrial. Maybe there would be an alternate juror who could be put on, in their place. But the risk of this conduct for a planning board member or a land use board member is if 
a decision is made and afterwards it is discovered that that person was in fact biased, it could lead to a lawsuit against the city that will take time, resources, and money to defend. And that is why the matter here tonight is important. We've all heard a chorus of supporters for Mr. Hewitt, emphasizing his expertise and willingness to do research and do his homework. And there's a place for that in our community. We're not suggesting otherwise. There's a place for activists, for people with strong opinions regarding many issues that face the city. And for people with particular expertise to conduct research and, and bring education to legislators or to act in a legislative role or as a lobbyist. But that has to be set aside when you're sitting on a land use board. When you're sitting on a land use board, you're sitting in a completely different role. And the guidelines, this juror standard, the quasi-judicial role, prevent you from speaking about particular applications, particular developments, particular um, applications that are gonna come before your board. Because the people that are coming before your board have a right to have you sitting there and be fair and impartial. So in addition to the juror standard um, and the quasi-judicial role, you're gonna hear evidence tonight about the right to know law. Um, and you will hear and see evidence that Mr. Hewitt engaged in communications with a quorum of the planning board also with the quorum of the technical advisory committee and other committees in violation of the right to know law. This again is wrongdoing <clears throat> in office, is wrongful conduct that affects, substantially affects the rights of your citizens. And it is in fact malfeasance. To email an advisory committee <clears throat> of your board directing their decision is the, like a judge from a higher court directing a decision of a lower court before the matter has come before them. These communications were done outside of the public record, outside of the public hearing. And this is the concern that the city has in regards to Mr. Hewitt's conduct. You've all been schooled on the right to know law. Public bodies such as yourself and the planning board are required to conduct their business in public at noticed hearings of which there are minutes and a record. When there is a communication of a majority of board members, whether it's in person or via email, electronic communication, um, about a matter, discussing a matter that may be f before their board, that is a violation of the right to know law. So this law supports our constitutional provisions that the government's work is to be opened to the public. There are many ways, as you know, to make mistakes or errors in judgment. Um, but what, before, what is before you tonight is an ongoing course of conduct of violations after many efforts to correct and counsel Mr. Hewitt. Finally, you will hear about an email exchange with Mr. Hewitt and one of the planning department staff in which, in the opinion of um, former city attorney Sullivan and the chairperson of the planning board was inappropriate use of his authority as a planning board member because he was putting pressure on that staff member to review the project that had already been approved by the planning board and add additional restrictions to it that were not in compliance with the decision of the planning board. 
This ongoing course of conduct during his tenure as a planning board member, the violations of the right to know law, this attempt to influence staff in the performance of their official duties, and violations of the juror standard by conducting himself outside of the public meetings in line with his strong opinions about matters before the board all equate to a finding of malfeasance in office and we'll ask you at the end of this hearing tonight to find that all the evidence that you've heard, which will include all the exhibits that have been entered, the witnesses' testimonies, and our arguments and memos of law, find that it supports that conclusion. We ask that you find he has committed malfeasance and ask that you remove him from office. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Morrell. Attorney Eggleton. Mr. Hewitt. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the City Council, Mr. Laughlin, citizens of Portsmouth. I regret to say that you are here to witness something we shouldn't be seeing in our state or our country. The city trying to remove James Hewitt from the City Planning Board rather than merely waiting for his term to run out in December of this year in just 11 months. They accuse him of malfeasance. What awful thing must he have done, you ask yourselves? Did James Hewitt steal money from the city? Did he take kickbacks from developers for preferred treatment? Did he accept a bribe in exchange for his vote? No, no, and no. And no to all the other things you might think of that would fall under any reasonable person's definition of malfeasance, as you and I or any other normal people might define it. No, the city accuses Mr. Hewitt of malfeasance because he sent some emails that they say he shouldn't have sent that he sought information, quote unquote, outside the record. Information that he thought it was important for the public to know. Information that he thought was important to be in the record so that the planning board could make the decisions it needed to make in the best interest of the citizens of Portsmouth. He wanted to make sure that applicants with project proposals were asking for enough parking, for example his bugaboo, conceitedly so. He spoke on issues that concerned him outside his duties as a planning board member, and guess what? He's allowed to do that in America. He wanted city planners, professional staff, to remember the advice and consultation that the planning board had given applicants at preliminary consulting meetings. When they asked for input about how to make their applications better and more acceptable to the planning board. He did his job. And for that, City Hall wants him gone. You are witnessing a campaign to destroy Mr. Hewitt's reputation. A payback campaign, because Jim Hewitt campaigned for the wrong candidates, had the wrong opinions, and demanded more scrutiny of projects from the city's planning board than the city wanted to give. Make no mistake, this is a punitive effort to inflict harm on a citizen who stepped up to volunteer for a land use board when the city asked him to. You might have noticed that when the city posted the papers for tonight's meeting on Friday for the public to review, they put this document online and out of this whole 107 page document, which was the council packet for tonight's meeting, do you know how many lines Mr. Hewitt got? One line, from the very end, highlighted in yellow on this sheet. One line, one sentence, I kid you not. So someone who wanted to see what Mr. Hewitt thought about these issues would have to read all the way to the end and then click on a link to 
to get his point of view. The city's thoughts were right there on the announcement on a link that read Council Packet, not Mr. Hewitt's. Now, I don't mind telling you that this whole process is an absurdity. I do this every day. I stand in court and I argue on behalf of clients against certain issues. This shouldn't be happening, folks. This is not the way this is supposed to work. It is decidedly inconsistent with the law of our Supreme Court on what constitutes the juror standard, on what constitutes a disqualifying set of facts for a particular planning board member. It is inconsistent with how our court has treated facts outside the record, quote unquote, or bias that violates the juror standard. There's law on this, and I have supplied it to you. And if you read it carefully, actually not even very carefully, you will see that Mr. Hewitt has not done anything that violates that law. And I'm so confident of that that if we get an adverse decision tonight, I know the courts are going to agree with me on that. It's going to have grave repercussions for this city because it will send the message. In fact, it's already sent the message that your volunteer service for the city of Portsmouth may come with a heavy dose of libel, slander, and defamation, which is quite the incentive you want to instill in your population. I do want to briefly talk about some of the facts that Attorney Morrill briefly mentioned in her opening from the 107-page memorandum that everyone was able to read on Friday. Incident number one concerning Rains Avenue. Now, Mr. Hewitt, he will testify, joined the planning board on January 1st, 2022. In December of 21, before he was on the planning board, he sent an email to some friends talking about the Rains Avenue project. He called it a monster project in that email, and he urged people to vote against it. That was before he was a planning board member. They're trying to hold him accountable for conduct, for acts that occurred before he was a planning board member. If you're not on the planning board yet, your communications are off the table. You're not communicating in your official capacity. You can throw that one in the dustbin. Incident number two. There's actually nothing in the communications that were given to us by the city concerning incident number two that pertains to Mr. Hewitt's vote to rehear that Rains Avenue project. That was not given to us as a reason for this malfeasance hearing. On the contrary, what Mr. Hewitt asked for in context number two was for certain environmental studies, which he knew to exist because of his knowledge, his experience, his familiarity with these issues, that they be part of the record. He wanted those to be considered at the public hearing. He wasn't trying to surreptitiously make decisions with the board. He wanted information in public. That's what he wanted and that's what he was looking for. The law on this issue is whether he showed active and affirmative prejudgment of a specific set of facts. It's very strict. Our Supreme Court has held that lively discussions off the record about the issue at hand do not constitute prejudgment of the facts. Ex parte emails between and amongst board members do not constitute bias about a particular set of facts. That is the law in New Hampshire. And Mr. Hewitt, his emails do not even rise to that level. So keep your ear out for exactly what he asked for when it comes to incident number two in February of 2022. Incident number three, a couple weeks later, 
a new applicant was coming before the planning board to ask for more parking for a project that had been approved a couple of years before. What did Mr. Hewitt want in that set of emails? He said, geez, this uh, project was heard by the planning board in 2019. Can we make that video clip part of the record for this matter? Can we take the worksheets that emerged from that approval process and make those part of the record of this matter so that the planning board sitting on this question today understands what the planning board was thinking three years ago? Does that seem like malfeasance to you? <laughs> to me, that feels like hard work, paying attention, understanding from his knowledge, his expertise, and his experience what the history of this property is, bringing what he has to bear to the table. And most critically on that point, he didn't even just willy-nilly send this communication. <laughs> He asked if it would be all right if it circulated between and amongst the board members. And the planning director said, sure, it's all pub public record. So he went and sent it. And now they're using it to argue malfeasance. Talk about a setup. Incident number four, which Attorney Morrill alluded to in particularity, Mr. Hewitt has a neighbor at 710 Middle Road, who got approval for an ADU at his house. Mr. Hewitt opposed that project assertively as his right, his neighbor. He's in a butter. He can do that. In, two, in uh, June of 2021, he stood in front of the planning board and said, please don't approve this project. And when it got approved with conditions, he appealed that question to the court. He's got a right to do that too. One year later, he wrote to the professional staff, not as a planning board member, but as a citizen of Portsmouth, and said, hey, have these guys abided by the conditions that was set by the planning board back in 2021? He's acting not on behalf of the planning board, but on his own behalf. He still gets to do that. So you can take that one off the list too. With respect to incident number five, last October, the planning board had a hearing on the 19th. At that hearing, Mr. Hewitt was pretty frustrated. The applicant wanted to subdivide property at 375 Banfield Road. From his personal knowledge and experience, Mr. Hewitt knew that the property in question, some people know of it as the Copeland lot, was heavily affected by environmental contamination from its former use. And in fact, that came up at the hearing. It was extensively discussed. The water coming off that property is dangerous to human health. That's all part of the record. Mr. Hewitt wanted to understand how it is that the Parties involved in that case were litigating a question of who was responsible when the city was a party to that case, and the person, the developer, wanted to tag the city. The developer wanted the city to pay for it. Mr. Hewitt said, I don't want to make this decision without understanding what's going on with that. And in fact, the TAC, the professional board that Attorney Morrill likened to a lower court, recommended to the planning board that the approval of that application, if it gets approved, be conditioned upon resolution of that specific issue. Who was going to pay for the cleanup? So the planning board was doing their job when they wanted to know what the status of the litigation was. And Mr. Hewitt wanted to know that, but they were told at the planning board meeting, uh-uh, we're not going to talk about that. You're not allowed to talk about that. Well. They were told by city attorney's office that they're not allowed to hear about that stuff. And I submit to you, that's not the job of the city attorney. It is the board's decision as to what is relevant or not relevant in a planning board session. City council, the city attorney can make recommendations, of course, but to be told, no, no, you can't touch that. You can't hear about that. That's wrong. That's wrong as a matter of law. 
And so Mr. Hewitt voted against the approval of that project. He said, we don't have enough information to make that decision. He was concerned about that. And there's, I will show you, reams of minutes about that. So all that's in the record. And he voted against it. And then afterwards, 12 days later, he sent an email to the folks on the planning board and said, hey, I want you to know why I was so upset about that. Please read these articles from the newspaper. Please read this opinion from the New Hampshire Federal Court. The decision was made. No more bias there. For that, he gets hauled into the principal's office. Last one. July 20th, 2023, an applicant at 581 Lafayette Road comes to the board for what's called a preliminary consultation. It's an awesome feature in New Hampshire law. It allows an applicant to come to the planning board and say, hey, I've got this idea. I'd like to do this. Uh, you have any feedback for me so that I don't gin up a whole application and then find out I missed something early on in the process? So they get the feedback from the board and Mr. Hewitt says, you know, uh, on this application, your survey plan that you did for your parking lot that you have, you've got features here, lighting, curbing, uh, parking areas, parking spaces that are actually on someone else's land. So please fix that before you submit your application. That was his advice. Pretty sound from my perspective. So then in December of 2023, when he learns that that applicant is now before the TAC, the Technical Advisory Committee, he sees that in fact they hadn't changed the plan yet. And so he reaches out to the TAC to say, hey, let these guys know that they still should do this because otherwise we can't approve it. It's on someone else's land. That's crazy. That's all he was doing. That's not malfeasance. That's trying to help the applicant put together an application that is complete and prepared for planning board review. So that's it. That's your malfeasance. No criminal activity, no lining of pockets, no taking advantage of his office for his personal benefit. Just trying to protect the interests of the city and its citizens, including those applicants seeking relief from the board. The juror standard goes to disqualification. It is not a factor in removal under the statute. It's a disgrace that we're here tonight having to do this. If this were a court, I would be asking for Mr. Hewitt's attorney's fees and costs and damages for defamation. We might get there, we'll see. But tonight it's the council's chance to step aside, to take the off ramp, to reject this effort from the city hall to turn this local democracy into rule by technocrats. It's not what the people want. After you hear the evidence, I encourage you to deny the city's motion to remove Mr. Hewitt and let him serve out the term of his office. Thank you, Mr. Eagleton. Uh, we will now hear. We will now hear. Uh, from, we, we have the presentation of documents or witnesses, or do we do, doesn't list that under the agenda, but we have public comment before or after. I think the documents are witnesses are next. Documents and witnesses next? Okay, That's we'll go. All right, we'll do that. Okay. Documents and witnesses. <laughs> okay. So um, the city first asks uh, attorney Bob Sullivan to come up. <laughs> Keep happening or not? There we go. So, um, Mr. Sullivan, for the purposes of the 
record that we have here tonight and um, for the people watching, can you just introduce yourself briefly? I could. Uh, my name is Robert Sullivan. Uh, I um, was formerly, prior to you, the city attorney for the city of Portsmouth. I had held that position um, since 1982 until October of uh, the year before last. Uh, so for a total of 40 years? I think the uh, actual total is 39 years of 40 anniversaries. And uh, the uh, in that role, which I began by myself for a number of years, and ultimately the staff grew, but in that role I did everything. Um, advised all the city boards and agencies, uh, uh, commissions, uh, Represented the city when it required representation. Uh, um, brought suits on behalf of the city when it was necessary to do that. Um, I uh, I um, advised the charter commission, which redrafted the city charter to form the government that we have today. Um, I was a uh, really jack of all trades, whatever needed to be done for the city, I did it for all those years. So as part of your, as part of your job as city attorney, did you advise your city departments on legal matters? Every city department, uh, including the charter departments of police, fire, and schools, um, and all the city boards, commissions, and agencies, including the planning board. And during those discussions, how often do you think you talked about the right to know law? Probably one of the main differences uh, in New Hampshire between running any kind of a private business or any kind of a private enterprise and operating a governmental, a municipal governmental operation is the right to know law. It, uh, it affects every aspect of the, the operation of the city government all day, every day. So I would say that on a daily basis, they will write to no law issues for the entire period. And how about um, when you're talking to boards and commissions, in particular the planning board, the land use boards, did you talk about their quasi-judicial role and the juror standard? For those boards and commissions which uh, had quasi-judicial roles, which uh, uh, would be the land use regulatory boards, primarily the um, zoning board, planning board, historic district commission, um, discuss the quasi-judicial role uh, frequently, uh, every now and then at the request of the planning department, uh, planning directors, I would sort of make the tour of all the different uh, boards and commissions and discuss right to know law issues, uh, what it means to act in a quasi-judicial capacity uh, and actually answer any other questions they might have. So that too was a very common discussion. And did you also represent the city in some um, land use litigation? Yes, yes. Is that a lot of, a lot of cases? Um, the, uh, I had, uh, before I came here, I actually spent five years in, uh, Nashua. And, uh, in Nashua, I, uh, had primary responsibility for representing particularly the zoning board. And, uh, at the time, city manager Cal McCanny hired me to come here. He said it was because of exactly that. He said, uh, he had been looking at the uh, experience representing the land use regulatory boards, and that's that's what he wanted. So I came here. So as part of your job as city attorney, did you uh, become acquainted with Mr. Hewitt, Mr. James Hewitt? Yes. Okay. And in what capacity was that? Um, 
when Mr. Hewitt uh, became a member, when the city council put Mr. Hewitt on the planning board, it became my responsibility to assist him in any way that I could in um, becoming a good planning board member. I would not have been expected that he would have a great understanding, for example, of the right to know law or uh, even of the quasi-judicial concept. Mm -hmm. And so there are two issues in which it would be my job to help him uh, function. And uh, did you um, have some concerns initially about Mr. Hewitt's ability to abide by those standards? Yes. Um, even after his appointment, but uh, uh, before he began to serve, uh, there were discussions in the, among the staff in the planning department that he was perhaps not understanding the role of a planning board member in the overall land use regulatory scheme and that he might be taking actions that properly belong to others. And uh, this implicated the, uh, the quasi-judicial role. And uh, so I did have some communication with him about that. You know, Mr. Hewitt and I were on the same side of that issue at that time. I'm sure we both desired that he would become a, a good functioning planning board member who fulfilled his role in the overall plan of land use regulation. And uh, so we were headed towards the same goal, I, I felt. So did you become aware of, a, of an email that Mr. Hewitt wrote to 105 Bartlett appellants? I did. Okay. And is this, I'm going to show you this email. We can try to put it up on the screen for everybody's. Yes. making that bigger? No. Um, so this would be in your packets um, as exhibit one, um, the email initially by Mr. Hewitt. And can you, um, can you tell the council what it was about that email that gave you some concerns? Sure. Uh, as a preliminary to answering that, uh, and as a preliminary really to everything that we're going to talk about, I have to say this. Um, the state of New Hampshire gives municipalities power to regulate land use in, within a particular municipality. This is, this is really an awesome power. Um, a person buys land, a person pays the taxes on that land, but before that person can do anything on that land, they need to get permission from the municipality in Portsmouth from the city. Now, in order for the municipality or the city having that kind of power over every individual landover, in order for that to be a fair system, the only way it works is if the property owner knows ahead of time before they want to do a project on their land what the criteria are going to be and how decisions will be made by the city and the criteria need to be adopted in advance so that the property owner knows these are the rules and they have to be the criteria have to be administered by people who will do so fairly without a bias without having made any determination on a particular project before that project gets presented publicly. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, the property owners is not being treated fairly. Their financial future with regard to their property is being decided by secret rules 
in a way that is not done in public. So it is really critical that the rules be followed and the decisions be made in public. Um, <clears throat> And those, and, and those rights are constitutional and, rights, correct? Right, right. That's right. So it is a constitutional matter in New Hampshire. So the issue that gets raised by this particular email is it demonstrates that uh, Mr. Hewitt, in writing this, has some pretty strong opinions about particular development in the North Mill Pond. <laughs> 100 foot buffers, um, large developments. I mean, it, it mentions a lot of things. And a planning board member voting in a quasi judicial capacity should be looking at the plans that are brought to him uh, in a, a neutral manner, unbiased. And uh, someone reading this email let's say the property owner of the property he's talking about here, reading this email, could reasonably conclude that maybe he was not unbiased. He wasn't performing his quasi-judicial role. Were so, there a certain tone or words in that email that gave you some concern? Absolutely. What were those? The, there are several. Um, just the fact that uh, Two projects, a prior one and the one in question here, is called a monster in the North Mill Pond. Those really aren't the words of a neutral, detached observer. Mm -hmm. uh, that suggests, even before he's looked at it, that he has a, a viewpoint. Um, the <clears throat> reference to uh, the Deja view all over again, he talks about, in reference to an earlier project that he disapproves of. Um, a suggestion, a clear suggestion that he would disapprove of this one again. Um, <clears throat> the There's a phrase in here um, talking about some earlier discussions that apparently you had with the developer. Um, what happened? Question mark, question mark. There may actually be a legitimate question. However, it's not the actions of a neutral observer or, if, or someone who's not made up his mind on the project yet. So he, in this uh, email, invites numerous persons to come to a, a meeting of the planning board and appear against this project, is the only fair reading of it, saying, I know it's a crazy time of year, and that is exactly why they, real estate developers, schedule huge, all capital, decisions just before Christmas. Um, Again, it's, it's the tone. Uh, if you had a judge who was talking about your case in court using this kind of language, uh, you would not think you were being treated fairly. <sighs> so. So this email, though, was sent before he actually was sworn in. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and, and yet it still gave you concern. Yeah, the email itself, or the content of the email itself, is not the precise concern. The, the price concern, precise concern is what this says in terms of his neutrality and objectivity and fairness in looking at projects going forward. Um, this is extreme, well, it's even before his the actual commencement of his career on the planning board. So it struck me as a really good teachable moment by discussing these issues with, with Mr. Hewitt. Uh, hopefully I could make it clear to him that you need to be careful as a member of the planning board. You need to be careful about what you say with regard to projects because you are the judge and you have to act 
in accordance with that kind of approach. Um, so did you reach out to Mr. Hewitt and discuss this I with did. him? I did. Okay, and you did that via email? I did. Okay, so also in Exhibit 1, there's an email from you to Mr. Hewitt. Is that your email? That is my email. Okay. And it's up on the screen as well. It's in your packet. So did you discuss these issues with Mr. Hewitt in your email? I did. I basically went over what I had just said here in this room, um, adding a little more detail. And this is not a project that you were concerned Mr. Hewitt was going to vote on, correct? Right. The, the, the point that I was trying to make here was trying to be helpful and cooperative to Mr. Hewitt to help guide him into a planning board career free of these kind of controversies. Okay. And um, did you get any response from Mr. Hewitt? Yes, I did. Did he indicate he understood your concerns? Yes, Mr. Hewitt, uh, I think, did understand my concern, indicated to me that he did. He was new on the planning board and, uh, and needed to learn these things, and I think he, frankly, appreciated some assistance. Okay. So, thank you. So now I want to talk about our Exhibit 2. So in uh, February of 2022, now this is after Mr. Hewitt was on a mem was uh, put on the planning board, correct? He's on the planning board now, yes. Okay. And um, there was an email sent to Peter Britz, who was a member of the planning department at that time? Correct. Is that correct? Okay. And I'll just have you um, look at this email, which is part of Exhibit 2. It starts with Dear Mr. Britz. Yes. Okay, and what was Mr. Hewitt seeking from Mr. Britz? Uh, what's happening here is that uh, in preparation for a, a plan that is coming for the planning board, uh, Mr. Britt, uh, Mr. Hewitt, contacting Mr. Britz alone, has asked for him to secure for Mr. Hewitt a, a number of different documents, uh, four, which amount to... Uh, environmental studies of various projects, uh, which Mr. Hewitt apparently believe had some relevance or similarity to the okay, and what, Avenue project at hand. Why did that concern you that he was reaching out to a member of the planning department for that information? Well, here's why. Because going back now to the, the plan of how land use is regulated by a municipality, and how it is kept fair. It is kept fair by having objective criteria that have been adopted before a project comes in, available in black and white for anybody in the world to read, and it is kept fair by decisions regarding that criteria and the project being made by uh, a, f a fair, person sitting in a judge-like capacity. Now, the reason why this concerned me, and Mr. Britz, I might add, is that it, it appears that here, um, uh, Mr. Hewitt is not sitting back like a judge and making that comparison of those criteria to the facts of the project. It appears that what he's doing is stepping outside that judge role 
and beginning to do personal investigation um, that uh, would then be applied apparently to the case coming before him. Well, if you, if you just think about it for two seconds, that is not what judges do. Prosecutors bring forward evidence. Defense lawyers bring forward evidence. Judges sit back and hear that evidence. And in this case, um, Mr. Hugh will be acting more like the prosecutor or the defense lawyer and going out and finding evidence rather than like the judge sitting back hearing the evidence. That was, that was my concern. And is that what you conveyed to him in this email? I did. Of February 17th? I did. Again, that's 2022? Yes. And did Mr. Hewitt respond to you in, in that email chain and indicate he had uh, understood your concerns? I know he did, but I don't see it here. Let me show you. Thank you. That portion yeah. of the email. Uh, yes, he did. Uh, Mr. Hewitt responded to me in a, what I thought was a very reasonable and uh, respectful way, indicating that he understood my concern. So, um, in addition to asking for this information from Mr. Britz, um, was there also communication with Mr. Hewitt um, in regards to the um, Conservation Commission and these projects? Yes, there were. Okay. So. In an email um, by Mr. Hewitt, dated February 16th, 2022, to the Portsmouth Conservation Commission. Did you see that email? I have seen it. So this is an email from uh, Mr. Hewitt to the Conservation Commission. Uh, and was it to the entire board? It was to... Five members. And was it in regards to the same permitting issue he had emailed to Mr. Briggs? It looks like it was, yes. Okay. And did you also have a conversation with Mr. Hewitt about emailing the Conservation Commission? Well, this is a totally different issue. Okay, but yeah. yes. Uh, as, we, as we discussed earlier on, you and I, the two main sort of legal <coughs> concerns that come up with new members of boards who are used to life in the private world and not life in the government world is that everything needs to be done in accordance with the right to know law. And uh, the right to know law uh, requires that the public business be conducted in public. And what that means is that decision-making by public bodies, such as the Planning Board, the Conservation Commission, uh, need, to be take, need to be taken in meetings which are advertised, properly advertised under the right to know law, and for which a number of formalities are attended, uh, such as uh, keeping of minutes, et cetera, and uh, allowing of members of the public to listen, uh, participate, and uh, so an email 
to a quorum of a public body gets this close to a per se violation of the right to know law, and if even one member of that public body should respond, it is a violation of the right to know law. Why is that? Because it is in effect a meeting taking place electronically over the internet rather than at a public place where there's been notice given to the public to attend. That's why. And you conveyed that concern to Mr. Hewitt as well? Yes, we did. And also in this um, email to the Conservation Commission, um, was Mr. Hewitt directing some of their activities and what they should be doing? He was seeking to, yes. Okay. And why would that be a concern for you? Um, really for the same reason. It's, it's uh, as it, well, for all of the reasons we've discussed. Um, it is the involvement of a planning board member in a conservation commission activity uh, which suggests that he is it, trying to control um, the review of the that different body of, uh, of a project which is ultimately coming to the planning board. And the uh, conservation commission, their role in this is to offer a recommendation to the planning board and the conservation commission really needs to make its own recommendation it doesn't get its recommendation from the planning board to give to the planning board and all this all this is part of that same basic fairness that the property owner trying to do this project has a right to know how decisions are going to be made, who's going to make them, and all those things ought have, have to be done in public. So I'm going to work through our exhibit four, I believe. Um, first, we might have. Exhibit three, actually. Sorry. So we have a lot of paper here to get through. <clears throat> so in March of twenty twenty two. There is an email um, provided to you by um, the former planning director, um, Beverly Zent, um, that was sent 
by Mr. Hewitt to the planning board members. And um, this email is March 15th, 2022. Can you just convey what the gist of that email is about? Yes. And what is that about? Uh, it is uh, expressing to the chairman and to some members of the planning board some concerns that Mr. Hewitt has about parking related issues at the West End Yards. Okay. And has he asked that that information be sent to the all members of the planning board or did he send that directly to all the members of the planning board this is sent directly to the chair and members of the planning board okay and did you have some conversations with uh, Beverly Zent about how that occurred uh, yes okay and in fact she actually um, sent an email to mr. Hewitt indicating that um, she had intended to send that information to the planning board instead of him? Yes. The, uh, of course, these are really variations of the same issues we've been discussing, but yes. Right. So why would it be an issue for Mr. Hewitt to send this information? Well, here's why. Go back to the original plan that we discussed about how land use is regulated and how it is supposed to be done in public using known criteria to be decided by fair uh, judicial type planning board members here mm -hmm. and the problem with this is that it's it steps outside that public forum it is a uh, a, a one planning board member communicating with other planning board members that a uh, in a, in a way which does not fit that system which is designed to create <clears throat> fairness. Um, the the information involved here is actually legitimate information okay. uh, that. A planning board might want to see but the way it gets to the planning board is not by one individual planning board member finding this stuff and sending it by email to the others the legitimate way for this kind of information to become part of the record and become public is for it to be done in the context of the planning board meeting um, one way an obvious way in a common way would be that uh, the planning staff would provide the entire planning board with any information they felt was relevant and it would become part of the the record of the meeting immediately among other things this means that the property owner whose whose property and income uh, are are affected by all this will know what's going on what's being said mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and be able to respond to it however that person deems appropriate okay. so that's why sending one planning board member sending an email to other planning board members without going through the planning staff in the way that I said is an issue okay and there appears to have been some confusion between Ms. Dent and um, Mr. Hewitt about who is going to send these emails uh, yes, I wasn't uh, part of this email string, but yes, that does appear to be the case if you read it. Okay. But still you talk to Mr. Hewitt about your concerns. I did. I did. Again, now, what I'm trying to do here is help Mr. Hewitt 
become a good functioning planning board member who operates the way the system is designed to operate and treats everybody, including the property owners, fairly. And so with that in mind, I did send him a brief email, um, not a legal memo on the topic, uh, but some, some guidance points. So when you say not a legal memo mm. on the topic, what do you mean? I'm not writing here for a court. Uh, I'm, I'm writing here for an individual I'm trying to help, I'm trying to, to give him some very straightforward, easy to remember um, guidelines that if he follows them, uh, he will be headed in the right direction with regard to these issues we've been talking, talking about. And uh, so that's what I sent to him. I sent a memo on, I can't see where the date is, March 16th, 2022. Okay. And in that conversation, you talk about the quasi-judicial capacity and where evidence should come from? Yes. And what do you say in there? The evidence should come from three sources. Yes. What sources are those? Sure. These are guide rails or guideposts. These are things if he keeps in mind. It will really help him keep out of trouble. Mm -hmm. And they all flow back to that picture I've been trying to create of a judge sitting there receiving information rather than the judge leaving the courthouse and going out and finding information. And, and what I tell them is uh, the The issues which are raised by uh, this uh, sending out of information on his own without going through the planning staff are, when sitting in a quasi-judicial capacity, the planning board should only be receiving evidence from three sources. The applicant, which is the application for the planning board, opponents of the application, anybody who wishes to oppose it, or the planning staff. What this is meant to do is exclude the planning board member as an individual from going out into the world and just finding facts. They are brought to them in a public fashion by those people. Uh, the planning board member should not be conducting independent investigation because the judge doesn't leave the courthouse. Facts are brought to the judge. And did you also have a right to know law concern here? I did, I did. Um, quote, evidence coming into the planning board in that capacity should only come through or at public proceedings. This is basic right to know law stuff. Um, the, all government in New Hampshire is supposed to be conducted in public. And, uh, and so an email just between board members that is not distributed to the public or put on the agenda is, a, is creates an immediate right to know law concern. So I'm suggesting stay away from that. And the way to avoid those right to know concerns is to let the staff convey that information. Because to the anything board. that the staff brings to the planning board is automatically part of the record in the case. And the property owner gets to see it. The opponents of the project get to see it. Everybody gets to see it. Oh, there was one more. Okay. Uh, now, this is an important one. Uh, we discussed it already, but I, I reminded uh, Mr. Hewitt <coughs> of it on March 16th. The right to know law prohibits the sequential communications which would occur if even one planning board member responded to an email from anyone addressed to the full board because that is the functional equivalent of a meeting. Once they start communicating over the internet, they are now doing the very same thing that happened at a meeting which is properly noticed for the public except it wasn't properly noticed for the public. That's the problem. And there are consequences for action. Yes, there can be. Uh, a few of them are that whatever action the public body takes in that manner uh, can be overturned. Uh, it is uh, 
if that should occur, the party that overturns it will be entitled to their attorney's fees for having done so. And there are even circumstances under which individual uh, members of public bodies can be subject to penalties. So, so there are a lot of consequences. So um, the next um, exhibit I want to talk to you about is exhibit four um, in regards to a project a detached ADU project at 710 Middle Road. Um, and emails between Mr. Hewitt and a member of the planning staff. Are you familiar with those? I am. Okay. And um, in regards to these mem uh, emails, those took place in July of 2022. And I'm just going to show you what we have in the binder here. And in these emails, um, <clears throat> what is um, Mr. Hewitt asking um, one of our planning staff, Vincent, to do? Uh, the member of the planning staff is Vincent Hayes, uh, an individual who, uh, as I said, is a member of the planning staff who I know very well, work with every day. Uh, and, uh, in this, in this top document, uh, uh, Mr. Hewitt is asking Vincent Hayes uh, or is actually making points, uh, factual points, with Mr. Hayes concerning a, 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 uh, a project at, a residential project at 710 Middle Road which I believe was his next door neighbor. Okay. And um, did you actually write a letter to Mr. Hewitt expressing all of your concerns about this? I'll have to find it for you. <laughs> a letter Thank dated you. July what, 19th, 2022? Yes. Okay. And. We'll bring it up on the screen. But in that letter, what concerns did you express to Mr. Hewitt about this? Here's what concerns me about this item of business. Um, people of the city have certain expectations from their public officials. And one of the expectations that the people of the city very fairly have of their public officials is that those public officials won't use their authority granted to them by the city for a personal benefit or in a way that might do harm to their neighbors or to other residents. Um, this situation does both. Well, how um, is that? Mr. Mr. Hewitt would very unlikely even know who Vincent Hayes is, except that by being a member of the planning board, Mr. Hay, Mr. Hewitt knows members of the planning staff. Vincent Hayes is a member of the planning staff. So by Mr. Hewitt, a planning board member, bringing these factual items, which are objections to his neighbor's project, by him bringing these to Mr. Hayes' attention, Mr. Hughes is both using his position as a planning board member to his own personal advantage to help him stop a project he wants to stop. And in Have order, please. Yeah. Guys, we'll just keep it quiet. This is courtroom. Go ahead. And the second thing, uh, the second thing is that, you know, Mr. Hewitt's neighbor is equally a citizen of the city, just as much so as Mr. Hewitt. So the idea that Mr. Hewitt might be able to use his position as a planning board member in a way that is harmful to his neighbor, that's exactly what the people of the city do not want to have happen. They don't want the, 
uh, mayor and council to put somebody on a planning board and for that person on the planning board then to use that newfound authority to harm some other citizen for personal reasons. That was my concern. All right. And that's what you conveyed in your letter? Yes. As part of the record? Yes. Okay. And um, as part of your letter, um, you gave uh, specific advice to Mr. Hewitt, is that correct? There's three bullets at the end. Could you just read those for the record? Yes, I did. And this came in uh, after discussion, communication with the then planning director, uh, Beverly Zent, uh, in order to stop this kind of a thing happening again, the kind of thing that we know the citizens of the city would not want to have happen. Uh, we we had advised Mr. Hewitt of the following. Citizen correspondence relating to public information requests shall be directed to the city attorney's office. Number two, he should cease all correspondence with Mr. Hayes at, relates, as it relates to the project located at 710 Middle Road. In other words, he should no longer use his position as a planning board member to get direct access to planning staff in a way that harms his neighbor. Mm -hmm. And last, uh, lastly, we, we advised that the city would take the matter under advisement and determine if any further action is, any further proceedings will be necessary. And that letter was signed by you and who else? Uh, Beverly Mesa Zent, uh, planning director at that time. So I think I just have one other matter to talk to you about. And um, more recently, in um, January of this year, are you familiar with some emails Mr. Hewitt sent to the Technical Advisory Committee? Well, let me say this. Once you start talking about more recently, you are talking about a period of time when I've been retired. Okay. Uh, however, in my retirement, I, uh, I work uh, as a part-time staff member for the city legal department, sort of a utility infielder. Do duties as assigned. Uh, that is not as encompass. That does not lead me to have as encompassing of a knowledge of what's going on generally in the city as m in my former days. But I still do know some things. <laughs> and uh, so. okay, were you? Did you become familiar with some emails written in January this year by Mr. Hewitt to the Technical Advisory Committee? Yes, not in any great depth. Okay. You recognize um, you've looked at those emails before? Yes, I've seen these before. Okay. And those are all in regards for a project at what, 581 Lafayette Road? Yes, they are. Okay. Um, otherwise known as a tour? Yes. Okay, so what is the problem with a planning board member emailing to the technical advisory committee, in your view? Well, we have already discussed this in some detail in other contexts. Um, <clears throat> it is, it is once again, a, a planning board member stepping outside of the quasi-judicial role um, of deciding a case based upon the evidence presented to that person and becoming involved in uh, other aspects of the project uh, in a way in which, let's say, the property owner here uh, would not be aware of. Um, because it's not done at public meetings and uh, and it's not the proper role of the planning board member. So 
But the technical advisory committee is made up of staff. Technical advisory committee is made of staff, uh, department heads with particularized knowledge, such as public works, police, fire, um, individuals who have technical advice they can offer to the planning board. And then the plan. And in the end, the technical advisory committee reports to the planning board. That's correct. So what's wrong with the planning board member communicating with the technical advisory committee in an email like this? It is a planning board member stepping out of the judge role that we've been talking about all evening and performing sort of an investigative role. It will be like the same person deciding a criminal case and assisting the detective bureau in putting the case together. It's, they, the two just shouldn't mix. And what should be the flow of information in this system that we have set up with TAC and the planning board? The flow of information is that TAC advises the planning board. The planning board doesn't advise TAC. <coughs> and when you say it's stepping out of that judicial role, are you concerned about bias again? I'm sorry. I'm are concerned. you concerned about whether there's bias injected into? Um, that would always, always be a concern. Because if a planning board member who's supposed to be the neutral judge is poking around in the world looking for facts and information, obviously if that planning board member finds facts and information, it's going to affect their thinking so that they will no longer be the neutral, detached judge. They'll have a bias. All right. Thank you. So I'm going to put this back. It's not entirely in the right order now. Fix that later. But there are the exhibits and um Attorney Eagleton. Passing of the mic. Sorry. Can you hear me okay? I think so, yep. Good evening, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you for joining us. Putting two statutes in front of you, which I know that you're familiar with. You've seen them before, correct? Uh, let me look at them. I'm sure I have. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I've seen both of these before. So, looking first at RSA 673.13. Got it. What's the title of that statute? Removal of members okay so it's the statute that authorizes a city council to remove a board member from office is that correct yes it is can you i left a highlighter there uh, on the table can you um do me a favor and highlight the words juror and juror standard in that statute Doesn't appear in the statute. Doesn't appear in the statute, right? So looking at the other statute in front of you, 67314. What's the title of that statute? Disqualification of a member. And juror, or the juror standard, that 
Those words appear in that statute, correct? Yes. And Oh, I see you've kindly marked it already. Yeah. You're welcome <laughs> to highlight it for me. Yeah. Great. Got it. So, uh, and disqualification, the statute for disqualification, we're talking about disqualification from a specific matter, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, do me a favor. Uh, can you highlight the word remove or removal in the statute? Which, which statute? 673.14. 673.14. The word removal does not appear in that statute. Correct. So we have a disqualification statute, and we have a removal statute, right? Sure. They have different language, wouldn't yeah. you agree? I do agree. And they have different standards, wouldn't you agree? They are different things, yes. Okay. Now, counsel asked you several questions about Exhibit number one, which was an email sent by Mr. Hewitt in December of 2021. Here's another copy of it for your reference. Yes. Now this email, what's the date of this email again? This date is Saturday, December 11th, 2021. Okay. And we agree, and you agree, that this was before Mr. Hewitt was ever a planning board member. Yes, right? I do. So is it not the law of the state of New Hampshire that if somebody is acting not pursuant to their duties, then it's not malfeasance? Is that correct? I've never actually looked at that okay. point. Um, and obviously, I'm not here to ask you about the law because you're a fact witness in this case. But you do agree that Mr. Hewitt did not have a vote in front of him when he made this communication, correct? Yeah, that's correct. And that this communication was not, in fact, part of his official duties, correct? I don't know about that. Well, he wasn't an officer yet, was he? He's been appointed. But he hasn't been sworn in, has he? No, but once he's been appointed, anything he says or does that reflects back on the planning board may well be part of his duties. What's the reference for that, Mr. Sullivan? Public confidence in the planning board. Where's the statute that says a planning board member's duties begin before they get sworn in? Doesn't that seem like common sense to you? And uh, actually, I think you did testify, though, pardon me, that uh, in response to a question from Attorney Morrill that the project he was talking about was not a project that you were concerned Mr. Hewitt would vote on, correct? Right. The whole point of all this correspondence was to try and assist Mr. Hewitt in coming to understand quasi-judicial. So going back to my question, though, uh, you confirmed that this was not a project you were concerned that Mr. Hewitt would vote on, right? That's correct. Okay. Now we're going to look at Exhibit 2, which you spoke about with Attorney Morrill. I've tabbed it for reference for you. Exhibit 2 is the February communications that they allege constitute malfeasance, in which, as you pointed out, Mr. Hewitt wanted to obtain some environmental studies about pieces of land, correct? Yes, yes. 
Now, anywhere, uh, please take your time to, to look at this string of communication. Is there anywhere in this email sequence where Mr. Hewitt says how he's going to vote on the project that's coming up for consideration? I have read in the past, and I don't think that Please is in there. Take your time. see where he says he's, how he intends to vote. He doesn't indicate what he's thinking about the project at all, does he? No, but of course that's not the point of this email. Well, you said that the issue was bias, that a fair judge, that a an applicant no. coming right. in would want to know that the judge that is hearing his case was acting fairly and had not prejudged the matter, right? What I said was the judge doesn't step outside the courtroom to gather evidence on his own, which is exactly what is happening here. Well, is that really the law, though, Mr. Sullivan? Because doesn't the law allow a planning board member to rely on his own experience and knowledge and education and common sense to make decisions. With regard to common matters, a planning board member who drives on Congress Street every day is allowed to use the fact that they know Congress Street is busy. Um, there's also a statutory provision that allows a planning board member to, to look at property. That's a subject of an appeal. Um, but that what we're talking about here is not those two things or even anything like them. What's happening here is that the planning board member is conducting an independent investigation, not relying upon common information or looking at the property as allowed by statute. And that's the thing that leads to the bias. What is the rule, the law, the statute, the regulation that bars Mr. Hewitt or any board member from seeking this information? The, the requirement that he maintain neutrality and objectivity. And you concede that nowhere in this document does he state how he's going to vote on this issue or whether he has any predisposition anyway, correct? At this stage in Mr. Hewitt's planning board career, what I'm trying to do is help him be a good planning board member. Okay. Meaning helping avoid the troubled waters of conducting his own personal investigation. Okay. So would you agree with me then that at this stage in his career, you were providing friendly advice about how to be a better planning board member? Yeah, it was my duty, I think, to provide him advice like that, yes. And that this request for information, nowhere in here do you talk about malfeasance? Correct? Correct. Okay. Now, if you flip towards the back, I've tabbed the statement that he made at the end where it says rookie. Do you see that tab? Um, yes. So after receiving an email from Peter Britz, about how he had copied the Conservation Commission on that same request. He apologized and he said, hey, my experience is to blame for this rookie mistake, right? Yes, he did. What was your response to that? Do you remember? Yes, I have. I wrote it. It should be here somewhere close by. It's the page before towards the top. Yeah. Uh, I wrote, uh, Mr. Hewitt, 
like Peter Britz, I too appreciate re your response. It shows a good attitude. Shows a good attitude, right? Yes. You ever told any other staff that they've got a good attitude about their job? You know, I am really happy that you asked me that question because the employees of this city are by and large excellent, wonderful staff. And I tell them probably every day I say to somebody, you know, you've really done a nice job, I appreciate your attitude. Um, you know, there's people in this room that really didn't have to be here, but they're here working to help uh, the common cause of trying to, to get this proceeding done. I'm, I am uh, really proud of the people with whom I work. So, turning to the continuing thread here. At the tab marked community knowledge, do you see that page? I haven't seen it yet, but I will find it. Community, community knowledge, got it. So on that page, attorney, uh, Mr. Hewitt asks, Friday, February 18th, he says, Dear Attorney Sullivan, understood. Recently, it takes a few whacks to get new information to register in my yes. COVID-19 addled brain. Is it possible to obtain answers to my questions for community knowledge that complies with the jury standard requirements? And what was your response? I don't have to find it. Right up top. Okay. You've asked a complex question, and I do not immediately know the answer. I will discuss it with the planning staff and see what we can come up with for a response. Have you ever given him an answer to that question? I think there is an answer in here somewhere. Oh, please. Uh, does it have to? This is a pretty extensive record, and I'd have to go looking through the whole thing before I could. Uh, answer you definitively, but uh, I'll represent Attorney Sullivan that I didn't see an answer in there, but so you're welcome to continue yeah. looking. <laughs> you know, I think I did answer. So but. this thing that you said was complex and you didn't have an answer, this, this notion of bringing community knowledge into the planning process, isn't that exactly what you're trying to remove him for now? Uh, to be truthful, I haven't actually found his question yet. Let me look. What I tell him um, by email dated February 17th is that although planning board members are allowed to rely upon their knowledge of the community in making decisions, those members are still required to avoid bias prior to a hearing and to make decisions based upon the evidence presented to them at the hearing, period, like a judge in a court period. Uh, therefore, a planning board member should not conduct any independent research into an application. To do so is an invitation to create a bias. Whatever the planning board member finds is likely to influence that member to favor 
or disfavor the application before the hearing. That would be the development of a bias and therefore it would be a violation of the jury standard. At its most basic level, a planning board member's duty when acting in a quasi-judicial role is to apply the facts presented to the board in the application and at the hearing to the objective criteria contained in the ordinance and regulation. When this is done, the approval or denial of the application suggests, should, should suggest itself. Sure, that's what you told him before he asked you the question about how he could get community knowledge into the process. And you said, in response, it's a complex question and I don't immediately know the answer. And my only question for you, Mr. Sullivan, is did you provide him one in this sequence or ever? Yeah, there is somewhere in this record a reference to that. Uh, and incidentally, did you try to remove uh, Mr. Hewitt from his position after his rookie mistake? I did not. Okay. We're turning now to March of 2022 and the city's exhibit three. We've talked a little bit about this and for your, to remind you, this is the one where Mr. Hewitt reached out to the planning director and said, hey, I'd like you to include these links to the prior planning board video of a meeting and then to two action sheets that emerged from a prior planning board meeting. Do you recall that? Uh, I've seen this uh, email before, yes. Uh, just a couple minutes ago, in fact. And so you said, if I recall your testimony correctly, that the information he wanted to include was legitimate info, right? You said that. Very often the case, yeah. yes. And that the legitimate way to get that information into the record, because you want it to be public, right? You want the you want applicant to know that it's part of a public process and he knows what the rules are, right? That's right. And that the way to do that would be to ask the planning department to incorporate that information into the record in the case, right? Very common, very yeah. legitimate. Can you flip to uh, the third page of the packet in front of you, which is says two of two in the bottom right. Do you see that down no, not here? Not yet, but I'll find it. Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, I'll help you. Yeah, please. Yeah. One of two. Two of two. Do you see that? Right down here. Oh, got it. Yep. Okay. So uh, I'll represent that this is an email. If you look at one of two, it's an email from Mr. Hewitt to Beverly Zent, who was planning board director? Planning director. Planning director. Thank you. Now do me a favor and look at the top of that page, two of two, and read for me what he requested that she do. Would you, this is... You, you're exactly yeah. right. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah. This is Mr. Hughes. Hewitt, I'm sorry, writing to Ms. Zent on March 14th and saying, would you please add an addendum to the March 17th planning board packet with the following West End Yard information? Right. So he wanted you to add this information to the packet that would be considered by the board at the public hearing, right? Not me. Not you. Miss that Miss the planning director. It appears to be the case, yeah. yes. Isn't that exactly what you said he should have done? Well, I think you're missing the point. No, no. I'm talking about your testimony. 
You said if he wanted to get that information into the record, he should go through the planning department. And I did not. I said he should ask the planning department to get the information. And didn't he do that? No. He's given it to the planning department. And he's asking them to circulate it out as part of the packet for the public proceedings so everybody knows what the information is that the board's going to consider, right? Where did it come from? It came from the planning board, right? Aren't those video clips from the planning board's decision about this applicant's prior project? I don't know what these things are. I'll represent that they are, Mr. Sullivan. And in fact, what was the planning director's response? The planning director's response was, good morning, since these are published documents, we can just forward these to the planning board. They do not provide any information that is not already available to the public. Thank you. I'm going to show you Exhibit 4 here, which is the packet of materials offered by the city to suggest that his communications about 710 Middle Road were malfeasance. I have it. All right. Would you flip to the first uh, substantive page, the one after the Exhibit 4 page? Just the very first one. Yes. So uh, it says at the top, can you read the top uh, set, the line of words there that begins Capital Improvement Plan? Uh, capital Improvement Plan, Citizen Request Form. Citizen Request Form, right? Yes. So this request form was submitted by a citizen, right? Designed to be, yes. Yes, and it was, in fact. It was submitted by citizen Jim Hewitt, right? Correct? Yes, citizen planning board member Jim Hewitt. Does it say planning board request form? No, it doesn't, but he's on the planning board. That's not what the document says, though, right? It says citizen request form. And where in this sequence of emails does Mr. Hewitt say, I'm on the planning board, you well, got to listen know, to me? This is a city, but it's not New York City. I think that uh, everyone involved in the planning department knows that Mr. Hewitt is a member of the planning board. I'm just asking, where in this sequence of emails does it say, I'm on the planning board? Um, you want me to look yeah, for it? Yeah, I do. Okay. He oh, says, hi, Vincent, addresses him by first name. Okay, where does it say, I'm on the planning board? Well, the reason he knows Vincent's first name is he's on the planning board. Mr. Sullivan, I'm asking you a simple question. Where does it say I'm on the planning board? Jim writes back to him, referred to him by his first name. I mean, Vincent does, suggesting they know each other. 
Because Mr. Hewitt is a member of the planning board. Well, does it say that? Their correspondence is addressed. Vincent and Jim. The correspondence does not say, I'm a member of the planning board, Vincent. It doesn't say that, does it? I have not seen it yet. Of course, he wouldn't have to tell Vincent he was a member of the planning board because Vincent's a member of the planning staff. Well, it's very important, isn't it, that when a planning board member is communicating about a personal issue, that he distinguishes his role as a public servant from his role as a private citizen. Wouldn't you agree? Sometimes. So there are times when it's okay for a public servant? No, no quite the opposite. There okay. are times when it is always impermissible. Well, in this case, did he announce himself as a member of the planning board and say, as a member of the planning board, I'm requiring you to do this? You know, this document is replete with acknowledgement of Mr. Hewitt's position on the plan board. Uh, listen, listen to this one. Uh, this is Vincent writing to Jim. Jim, also, staff reminded me that if you have an account in Viewpoint that you can track projects, or let me word that uh, accentuate a little different. Jim, staff reminded me that if you have an account and viewpoint, you can track projects. Vincent can help with that. And that's Beverly Mesa Zent, planning director, telling Jim. So I'll so represent that it's nowhere in this document that Jim Hewitt says, hey, I'm a member of the planning board and I'm entitled to this information because of that. I will make that representation. If you can find something in there that contradicts what I just said, you're welcome to bring it to my attention. I did not see it. No, I'm willing to accept your word for that. Okay. Because I know that everybody in the planning department knows Jim Hewitt is a member of the planning board. He doesn't need to say it. Okay. Now, could a private citizen who had an adverse decision about his neighbor's lot approach the planning department and say, hey, back in 2021, the planning board granted approval for this ADU with conditions. Have they fulfilled those conditions? Could a private citizen do that? A private citizen could say that, whether the planning board would respond or not. Sure, absolutely. But that's the entitlement of a private citizen in the city of Hanover to, uh, excuse me, Portsmouth, to ask if the neighboring property whose project they opposed was actually fulfilling the conditions that the planning board imposed. That's okay for someone to do, right? A private citizen. Yes. Yes. So. But there are things that a private citizen can do that a member of the planning board cannot do. That's kind of why we're here tonight. Well. But when the private citizen is a planning board member, does he give up his right to free speech? If a private citizen is a planning board member, does he give up his right to free speech? Yes, in some circumstances. Plan does he give up his right? right? A private citizen serving as a... A private citizen serving as a planning board member is not free to say certain things and continue on as a planning board member. A private citizen could not say, there is no way I am ever going to approve any project ever on the North Mill Pond, and then sit on a project on the North Mill Pond. Can't do it. When did Mr. Hewitt say that? I'm giving you an example. Okay. So that example has nothing to do with our case. Wouldn't you it agree? Answer, but it answers your question. So, but does a private citizen who also happens to be a planning board member, who didn't sit on the approval of his neighbor's case have the right to follow up with the city and say, hey, did they comply with the conditions that the board laid down when they approved this project? You can make that request, yes. Thank you. And in fact, 
when Mr. Hewitt makes that request, he specifically asks for whether the applicant complied with a specific requirement that the planning board laid down for a new survey plan. Wouldn't you agree? I'd have to find the... If you look at the email at page... Three? Fourth page in the document, dated July 15, 2022. I have it. So in this uh, communication, uh, Mr. Hewitt conducts a colloquy with uh, Mr. Hayes, the planning staff member, um, about his neighbor's project. Yes, and, and if Mr. Hayes was willing, he could have that colloquy with any member of the public with a similar concern, correct? He could if he was willing. Okay, now, I'm showing you- Of course, you... he's more likely to be willing with a member of the planning board. That's your supposition. It is. So, I'm showing you exhibit S from our packet, which council has agreed to admit and we'll supplement our filing here with it. It's a June 23, 2021 planning board decision granting a conditional use permit for a detached accessory dwelling unit for a property located at 710 Middle Road, correct? Uh, it looks like that. I have not seen this before. Okay. now. Condition number two, can you read it for me? Uh, the applicant shall provide a surveyed stamped plan in order to confirm the existing and proposed building coverage calculations prior to building permit issuance. And isn't that exactly what Mr. Hewitt was asking Mr. Hay Hayes, thank you, whether they had completed that condition? Uh, I don't know. There's a lot of discussion here about a new survey plan, new lot coverage, new open space calculations, and and Mr. Hewitt is telling Mr. Hayes that these things need to be performed. Yes. Yeah. And Talk in Exhibit S, you just read a requirement that says the applicant shall provide a surveyed stamp plan in order to confirm the existing and proposed building coverage calculations prior to building permit issuance, right? Uh, so in addition to this new survey plan, new lot coverage and open space calculations need to be performed and new site plans prepared to satisfy the following. Uh, and then there's something about a heated first floor laundry room needs to be eliminated and water and sewer service need to originate from the 710 middle road structure. And if you look at exhibit S, are those not conditions two, three, and four of the conditional use permit that was issued by the planning board on June 23, 2021? Well, they're not mirror images, but they're similar. Substantively similar, right? Mm -hmm. uh, incidentally, this project did come back to the planning board last spring, Sullivan for a request 
to extend the permit period because the construction hadn't begun. Are you familiar with that? I am not. Do you know what Mr. Hewitt did as a planning board member when this issue came up before the planning board? No, I do not. If I told you he recused himself, would that surprise you? <laughs> I'd say that he did the right thing. Indeed. Showing you Exhibit L from our packet. And I'll sort of clean things up sure. here for you. Okay. Take a minute to take a look at it. So there's an email on the front from him to you. You see that? I do. And then the second page contains, although I do not remember ever seeing this before. And then the second and third pages contain an email from you to him, correct? Um, second page. Second into the third page. Uh, Your email begins on the second page, flows into the third. Do you see that? Uh, yes. Dear Mr. Hewitt, please recall. So I'm going to read this email so that we can talk about it. You can read along with me. It says, Dear Mr. Hewitt, please recall the May 2 City Council meeting which you attended in person. During that meeting, there was a contentious discussion of an issue pending before the City Council regarding an appropriation of funds to implement a previously approved conditional settlement agreement in the case of Sobo Square versus City of Portsmouth, McIntyre. During the public hearing on the appropriation, the audience had begun to applaud those speakers with whom it agreed. In order to maintain appropriate decorum in the council chambers, Mayor McEachern politely requested that there be no applause. In response to his request, you took two actions, which now call for some concern. Have I read accurately up to this time? Yes, you have. Yeah. One, rather than applaud, along with others, you then made hand signals said to represent the sign language equivalent of applause. Two, subsequent to the meeting, you wrote an email to all the members of the council which highlighted the meaning of your hand signals. The mayor has asked that I write you about these concerns. His point is not one of legality. Did I understand that correctly? You read it accurately. While your actions were likely con constitutionally protected, they may not have shown the respect for the municipal government process, which is expected of a member of the city planning board. When you are sitting on the planning board, you have the reasonable expectation that those who appear before you be respectful. The city council is entitled to the same expectation, especially from a member of another branch of city government. The mayor believes that your conduct described above did not meet that expectation. Accordingly, similarly to my message contained in my email to you of December 15th, 2021, regarding the juror standard, you are requested to be mindful in the future that your membership on the planning board creates a higher standard of conduct in governmental proceedings than is applicable to the general public. Did I read all that correctly? Uh, yes, you did. So, where the standard that you're talking about, where does it say what law tells Mr. Hewitt that because he's on the planning board, he cannot make his opinion known at a city council meeting about an issue having nothing to do with the planning board. What law says that? Unless the issue concerned a, a case which appeared or was going to appear in front of the planning board. Um, then I don't think there's any law that says that. Yeah, there is no law, right? It's not one question of legality, as you correctly put it. Um, tell me, how did you learn about this incident that you were reprimanding Mr. Hewitt for? Uh, I heard about this from the mayor. 
Tell me about that conversation. How did it occur? Gee, that's that's really all I remember about it. It wasn't. Uh, I don't think there was anything written or anything of that nature. Did you tell the mayor that Mr. Hewitt has a First Amendment right to speak on issues of public concern? I don't. I don't remember whether I said that or not. Did the mayor ask that you issue this cease and desist letter to Mr. Hewitt? about his conduct at the public meeting? This uh, letter, of course, isn't really a cease and desist letter. It's more of a friendly reminder, but uh, but yes, the friendly reminder was written at the suggestion of the mayor. And when the mayor asked you to write it, was he upset? about Mr. Hewitt's behavior at the city council meeting? I, I, do, I don't really remember a lot about that conversation. I think it was something that just happened in the, you know, our offices are close. I think it just happened in the hallway. So on the basis of a kind of casual offices are close kind of interaction, you decided to reach out to Mr. Hewitt and tell him, how to speak in public? Yeah, I think it was suggested by the mayor, actually. Okay. And what did the mayor say exactly in order to get you to write this letter? Um, suggested, I think, that I should do what I could do to try, try to help maintain decorum in city government. By telling Mr. Hewitt alone. Sh Show a little respect to the council, yeah. Now, uh, I'm going to show you another exhibit that we've marked here as Exhibit R in our case. This is the City of Portsmouth, New Hampshire Planning Board Rules and Procedures. Do you recognize that document? Is this the current version? No, this is last amended by the Planning Board, January 28th, 2024. Yes, I have seen it. Uh, is it fair to say, Mr. Sullivan, since you've been working on these issues for the city of Portsmouth since 1982, that you are pretty familiar with this document? Actually, I'm not this version. Okay. This was adopted after I had retired. Um, in your history, your 40 plus year history of doing this work for the city of Portsmouth, did you ever craft planning board rules and regulations that addressed how a planning board member should address the city council? I have uh, certainly drafted planning board rules. I do not believe I ever put anything in any planning board rule at the request of the planning board um, uh, that, it, that indicated how one should address the council. Right, so it's fair to say and you're welcome to look, but it's fair to say that there's nothing in this document that requires Mr. Hewitt to abide by a greater, more respectful standard of conduct than the average citizen, right? Right. Well, I haven't read it, but I wouldn't expect there to be anything right. like that in there. So this maxim that you're advancing to Mr. Hewitt in this letter, in fact, has no legal basis at all, right? Right. It wasn't intended to. Now, the last incident that council mentioned to you in their Exhibit 6. Which I'll put in front of you again. So, I think you said uh, regarding this exchange, and to remind you, this is a situation where Mr. Hewitt contacted the technical advisory committee and told them what the applicant, what he had told the applicant in July, right? Yes. So 
your overall assessment of this was that an applicant is entitled to have the information, the facts, the legalities that decide his or her case to be presented in a way that the applicant would be aware of, right? Yes. That's your general premise. Fundamental fairness, I would say. And wasn't this information that Mr. Hewitt wanted to bring to the attention of the TAC information that Mr. Hewitt had, in fact, told the applicant in July? That is what he, he represents. At a public hearing of the planning board, right? That, I believe, is what is being represented, yes. So this is information that he acquired in the context of his duties as a planning board member. Wouldn't you agree? And the abutting landowner agree to formalize these encroachments. I actually do not know. Okay, I'll make the representation that that is going to be my client's testimony about this issue. But you actually have no knowledge, is that fair to say, about how he acquired this information? That's correct. So I'm going to ask you to give you a hypothetical here. If he acquired this information that he's now reminding the TAC about, at the July 20th, 2023 meeting of the planning board from the applicant. Is he not telling the TAC information that he learned in the context of his duties? If, as you say, that's how he found it out, then that is how he found it out. Okay. And under RSA 617, 67314, I'm going to read you the last sentence of subsection 1. And you can confirm if I've read it correctly. Last sentence, Attorney Sullivan. Reasons for disqualification, and this is in reference to the juror standard, reasons for disqualification do not include exemption from service as a juror or knowledge of the facts involved gained in the performance of the member's official duties. Correct? Uh, that's what this says. And that's a law in the state of New Hampshire, isn't it? With regard to whether or not uh, that could be used as a reason to disqualify him. With regard to whether the juror standard was violated, right? But our concern here is a little more refined than that. Taking an active role in front of another board on a case which uh, would be coming to him as a planning board member is is the very switching of roles that we've been talking about all evening. So what's the statute or the law that prohibits Mr. Hewitt from bringing to the attention of the tax an issue that he brought to the attention of the applicant in July. He's supposed to be the judge. But he already told the applicant, in order to improve the applicant's application, mind you, that you've got to fix this before it gets to us, right? The, the information is legitimate, but it should be brought to TAC by staff or TAC itself. It should be brought to TAC itself? Yes, TAC can go out and find information. All the questions I have for Mr. Sullivan. Sure. Thank you. This is, is your stuff here. Yeah, I'll grab it. Yeah. 
haven't done yet or not. If I'm done. Redirect. Your Honor. It's possible to have a bio break. Brief bio break. I, we'll I, take I, don't, a I don't intend to ask any further questions. So um, if Mr. Sullivan can be excused. Is there any questions of the counsel for Mr. Sullivan? I had, I guess, two. Um, one, the, uh, I guess I noticed on the email correspondence uh, from Mr. Hewitt to Vincent uh, copying the planning board chair and the, uh, the planning director, is that common for uh, questions of uh, a citizen? Uh, no, it would not be. Okay. And then uh, the second one uh, regarding the, uh, the email that you sent uh, claiming to be on my behalf. Do you remember uh, the email that I sent you in follow uh, to that email? I do not. Um, if it's okay, I'd like to read that uh, email. Um, Bob, this is already sent, but I'd asked you to send a note to I'm going to object. What? Where is this in the record? In the, you, where was the, where was my email? I didn't see the. The email. My point exactly. So you're happy to, um, you're asking the, you mentioned an email where I, I sent a, an email to, or I, uh, I was copied on an email to Bob. I'm sending the, the response that that was a mistake to send to Mr. Hewitt. I did not mention that email. Mr. Sullivan mentioned an email. Didn't you provide him with an email? I provided an email between Mr. Hewitt and him. I believe, okay. I was on that email, though. You didn't mention that I was on the email. I guess, and it, I was just trying to clarify that that was a mistake from Mr. Bob Sullivan to send that email. <clears throat> That's fine. All right. We'll take a 10 minute recess. Go to the bathroom. Thank you, Your Honor. Oh, sorry. Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I actually have a question also about um, the uh, exhibit for. Um, and this is a question, it maybe it's related to staff, so I do, I'm not sure that um, Attorney Sullivan can answer this, but um, why would uh, Mr. Hewitt be given access to viewpoint to investigate the process on 710 Middle Road if he wasn't a planning board member? Well, my thought was because he's a member of the planning board. Um, and follow up to that, do we give other residents access to Viewpoint to investigate the status of uh, current projects? I actually don't look at Viewpoint myself, so I, I don't know the answer. I, I'm going to make a representation that Viewpoint is the publicly available database for the City of Portsmouth for all of its residents to register and look at planning and zoning permitting issues. Yeah, that was my point. Okay. Um, my point when um, uh, Mr. Eggleton, when responding to the email, that it was not my desire or assertion that Mr. Uh, Sullivan write to Mr. Hewitt, something that I've since shared with Mr. Hewitt numerous times, and that my ask of that evening was to send a note to Mr. Mahana who had referenced uh, a developer as I think it was a, um, a dictator uh, during a public comment. And so I would like to correct the record that I had asked Mr. Sullivan to share uh, with Mr. Hewitt uh, anything uh, to do with my displeasure with his uh, sign language, which for the record I found somewhat amusing. Councilor Cook. Um. I just had one more question in that line of questioning. Um, is it regular for our staff members to set up viewpoint accounts for members of the public? Again, I, uh, I do know this about viewpoint. There are different levels of access in that the public might have some level of access. Some staff members have some access. Other staff members have other access. It's not broad across the board. If I, if I could respectfully, just to clear this point up, because we're getting kind of lost in the weeds here. Um, there's one set of access for staff 
to Viewpoint, and there's a different set of access for members of the public, and planning board members are under that umbrella of members of the public. They don't have any special access. Thank you. That's what I wanted to know. Any other questions? Your excuse, Mr. Sullivan will take a 10-minute recess.
introduce yourself to the, the council. My name is Rick Chalman. I live in State Street, and I'm the chair of the planning board. And what do you do as a profession? I'm a licensed engineer, land surveyor, land planner, expert witness. In what capacity are you an expert witness? Land use matters, zoning matters, street design, a lot of transportation issues. How long have you been on the Portsmouth Planning Board? Uh, just over three years. And have you been chair during that time? I'm starting my third year as chair and starting my fourth year on the board. And um, as part of being on the planning board, you're familiar with Mr. Hewitt? I am. Did you have any planning board experience or land use board experience before you were put on the Portsmouth Planning Board? Uh, considerable. I was, <clears throat> excuse me, I was on the Tufton Borough Planning Board for nine years, several years ago. I, was, I chaired that planning board for a time. I was on the Zoning Board of Adjustment in Tufton Borough. I was also on the Board of Selectmen. I chaired that board for a while. And what is your understanding of your legal role as a member of the planning board in making decisions for applicants? Well, that's something of a complicated question. Um, you familiar with the quasi-judicial role? Of course. Okay. And is that something that you've learned through being on the Portsmouth Planning Board or throughout your experience? Both. And it comes from both being on a planning board and being an applicant to planning boards uh, thousands of times. And... Um, are you familiar with New Hampshire's right to know law? I am. And um, you've had to um, become familiar with that, not only in Portsmouth, but in your prior experience. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Um, so you've had training on these legal principles, the juror standard, quasi-judicial role? Yes. And is that as part of your um, volunteer public body experience? Part there and also part of some of the continu continuing education that I do for my professional licenses. For your professional? Professional work. licenses, yeah. Okay. And have you also had some training from the New Hampshire Municipal Association? Yes. And is there a certification now for planning board members? There is. It's voluntary, but you have to pass an exam. And, and what does that cover? The Planning Board Handbook, which is put out by, I believe, the Office of State Planning. And did you take that exam? I did. And do you know if Mr. Hewitt did? He did. Did you both pass? We did. Um, so during your time on the Planning Board and as chair, um, have you had any concerns about Mr. Hewitt's conduct as a planning board member? Yes, I've had two occasions I've had to write to him formally. Okay. And can you generally give us what the nature of those concerns were? Well, as I understand the uh, Dover v. Williams case, which is a New Hampshire Supreme Court case, <clears throat> that both of you have cited in your memoranda, one of the standards for crossing the threshold of malfeasance is doing something which you shouldn't do. And I know there's been a lot of discussion tonight about this statute, that statute, this, this sentence, but that particular sentence struck home with me because it's not, and it's also not an instance, um, a single instance, I think as you pointed out earlier, or somebody pointed out earlier this evening, but a pattern of behavior can become a pattern that you shouldn't be doing. And I felt at times that Jim has been pushing that envelope in ways that he, he shouldn't. Okay. So um, what I'm going to ask you about a little bit are the exhibits that we have. Um,
so in exhibit three that we have, there's a, um, an email. Um, and I'll ask you if you recognize this as an email um, directed to you and all the planning board members from Mr. Hewitt. Yes, I, I have seen this. Okay. And that was an email in which Mr. Hewitt brought some references, some links to um, other documents to the attention of the planning board? Yes. Okay. And did that cause you any concerns? It, yes. It, it's a concern not as to the information but the manner in which you bring it forth. Um, the proper way to do it is at a public hearing and just say, I think the board should be aware of uh, these prior actions, whatever it is you're trying to bring to the attention of the board, to bring it up at a public hearing. That's the purpose. And that's just so everybody understands, when we sit at the same place that the council is sitting, when we sit as planning board members, um, the point at which it becomes quasi-judicial is when the board takes the information that the applicant has submitted, the staff input, and then the public input, because that's, that's information that hasn't existed until the night of the public hearing. So it doesn't come together until that night of the public hearing, and that's when the board <clears throat> deliberation takes place. So that's the time you raise these issues. And if it's something that's absent from the record, <clears throat> but the board feel it's necessary, feels it's necessary, then the request is made for that information. The matter may be continued until that information has been provided. So it's not, is it a good idea to have this or that piece of information? You just don't do it outside of the public meeting. And is there a way to provide knowledge to the planning board, uh, com community knowledge or, or specialized knowledge from independent research? Um, to the planning board to get it into the packet? Is there a manner in which to do that? Well, there's two parts to that as I understand it. Uh, community knowledge, each planning board member being a resident of the city would have their own levels of community knowledge that they would bring to the table. Um, specialized knowledge is something Mr. Hewitt has. He's a licensed engineer as well. I have some as a licensed professional myself. but it is not proper for us to necessarily analyze something in a technical sense, doing calculations and that sort of thing. If you feel a need for, if, if we spot something that needs professional uh, information to supplement the record, you would request that at the meeting and require the applicant to provide it and or have outside peer review by another licensed person to review what's been submitted. And again, the reason why it shouldn't be conveyed in an email to the entire planning board? Well, the, you run, that's having communications outside a meeting and that's a violation of the right to no law as I understand it. So I wanna ask you about exhibit four. I'm not going to pretend to remember them by number. No, no, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. It has to do with the um, 710 Middle Road. And there were some questions about access to the viewpoint system by planning board members. Um, can you answer that question? Do planning board members have special access to the viewpoint system? Not special. We have access. Uh, I believe we can see everything except staff comments that are restricted to staff staff level access. Okay. And um, is that set up especially for planning board members or is that set up as, as, as a citizen request? You can set up a viewpoint account yourself if you have some the technical expertise. It's not the simplest software to use, but it's, it's out there if you want to dig in. And um, as uh, in this exhibit four, there's um, a copy of capital improvement plan citizen request form. Have you seen that? Yes. Okay. 
And um, that's in regards to the Middle Road project. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So it's not really in regards to a capital improvement project. No. I, somebody could, if you fill out a form that uh, is intended to order food from a restaurant and you ask for an engine, cha engine change, oil change, you know, it's not exactly the correct form to be using. It's. Can you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> if you uh, were looking at a menu in a restaurant, but you were thinking about your motor vehicle that needed an oil change and said, I want an oil change, the wait, waiter or wait, wait staff may not be able to bring you exactly what you're looking for. Um, st stating this on a capital improvement, whether or not it says citizen request form, all that means is it's accessible by somebody. So I don't, I don't take much meeting over what the heading is. Okay. And um, the project location on this form is indicated as 710 Middle Road, correct? A monster de de detached ADU warehouse? Yes. Okay. Now, you had some concerns about this email and a chain or this request and a chain of emails between Mr. Hewitt and a staff member of Vincent Hayes? Yes. Okay. And, and we've talked about some of that. Um, I'm going to show you your letter written July 20th of 2022 um, to look at while we discuss what your concerns were about this exchange between Mr. Hayes and Mr. Hewitt. Okay. So you were, um, there was an exchange in which Mr. Hewitt was suggesting um, particular conditions that were attached to this project that Mr. Hayes should be conscious of as he was approving or not approving it going forward with the building permit, correct? Yes. Okay. And were some of those um, concerns that he expressed to Mr. Hayes outside of the planning board decision and the conditions that the planning board had on this project? That's what I raised on page two, the one, two, three. Fourth full paragraph, <clears throat> starting with concerningly, um, I felt Mr. Hewitt was raising a new matter that wasn't in those conditions. And what was that? What was the new matter? How the open space re requirement may have been misapplied. Meaning the general rules and regulations of open space were not applied correctly to this project in, in approving the project? I'd have to go back to look at his, um, the issue, and just so that everybody understands this, I voted against this application that evening. <clears throat> and my one of my concerns was that um, the open space calculation was so razor thin close to the requirement, but there hadn't been a survey submitted that there should be a survey plan and that the planning board agreed and made that a condition. And Mr. Hewitt raised that and that was one of the things that um, was made a condition of the approval. In his, when I wrote this letter in July of 2022, I was concerned that Mr. Hewitt might be going beyond what the planning board had established for conditions and come up with his own new conditions. And since it was a matter he had litigated as an abutter, which I agree with his attorney, he certainly has the right to do that. But it also, to me, if, if I were that person raising that issue, I'd be a little bit more careful about per perception and how people would see me as a planning board member instructing staff to do something. That, to me, is 
not something you should do. And that's what you conveyed in your letter to Mr. Hewitt? I don't know if I used those exact words, but I know I've, I have used those exact words with Mr. Hewitt in the past two years. And in your letter, um, were you concerned about um, violations of the juror standard or the quasi-judicial role of a planning board member? Well, since you took the letter, I don't remember if I used those words exactly, but um, again, I felt it was not appropriate, first of all, to go outside your question, but I think it's relevant here. If one of us as a planning board member approaches a staff person, I think it's incumbent on us as a planning board member to say, I'm approaching you as Rick Shulman who lives on State Street. I'm not coming to you as the planning board chair. I'm not coming to you as this. It's really important to me as a citizen because otherwise the presumption is going to be you're a planning board member. I mean, as chair, it's, it even more applies to me, obviously, because I, I have to come here all the time for different things and, you know, it would be very difficult for me to remove that, that um, title, I guess, from anything I do with staff, and so I'm especially careful. But for a planning board member, I think you would have to just lay that out very specifically with any communication. And to me, the presumption is if you're on the planning board, you would better say you're doing this outside your position as a planning board member. So it should be, you know, the burden on the board member to indicate whether they're acting in that capacity or not. Right. And it, this is, uh, it goes to decorum. It goes to now, this is what staff will tell planning board members and have told planning board members in my presence. They've told me this uh, when I first came on the planning board, even though I knew it. And um, it's just good behavior. So I think, um, let me find his exhibit S that he brought in. So I think this is uh, Mr. Hewitt's exhibit S, which is actually the conditions um, that the planning board put on this project at 710 Middle Road. And, um, is number two the provision that you were referring to us um, provide a stamp plan to confirm building coverage calculations? Yes. Okay. And then in this email between from Mr. Hewitt to Vincent Hayes, is he going beyond that requirement from the planning board? Well, he's listing two additional points that uh, aren't listed in that condition on the, the approval. What, what are those points? About the heated first floor laundry room, the water and sewer service is listed in a different condition. And I don't know if the heated first floor laundry room relates to the heat. It, I don't know the, how those relate to the lot coverage and open space calculations or if he in, didn't intend it that way, but that's, he's got a colon and then that's the first item listed after saying open space calculations. So, um, the new lot coverage and open space calculations need to be performed and new site plans prepared to satisfy the conditions that the planning board put on its decision. Is that accurate or does that go beyond the requirements of the planning board? The, the calculations have to be done based on the new, the new plan. So if the new plan showed a different area, it would result in different calculations. If the if this new plan, the actual stamped plan showed the same area, you'd have the same calculations. Um, I don't remember how close, but it was very, very close. The uh, 
you know, very small number of square feet would tip it as not compliant with the open space requirements. So in your letter to Mr. Hewitt, you're concerned for the most part with his tone of direction to a staff member as a planning board member. Is that correct? Yes, and we have been, we planning board members have been told um, not to direct staff to do things repeatedly. Um, it's, it's not in the planning board rules. Actually, it is in the planning board rules as well. It is in the new planning the current, board the rules. The current planning board rules, yes. And, and that is that planning board members are not to direct staff specifically or, or um, directly. Correct. And how are they supposed to convey any concerns that they might have to staff? Through the chair. So um, in your letter, um, you talk about Mr. Hayes, instructing Mr. Hayes on how to satisfy some of the conditions of this approval in even including the suggestion of a need for outside peer review and you bring up a new matter regarding your opinions with respect to open space requirements. So that was bringing up new matters that were outside the scope of the approval that the planning board had already given this, this project. Is that correct? Yes. Um, he also, you said, concerning, concerningly raising a new matter, such as how the open space requirement may, in your opinion, have been misapplied, is also inappropriate because the appeal period for such a, such a suggestion has long lapsed. Can yes. you explain that? Well, he, Jim, Mr. Hewitt raised the question of whether the open space calculation was misapplied and <clears throat> again that's not in the condition the letter of decision which was signed by the planning board and is signed by the planning board chair after each decision um, and if he had a question with that it probably should have been raised in his appeal or it should have been raised at the planning board meeting not with the compliance officer which I believe is what Mr. Hayes is role is uh, some years later. Okay. One moment while I shift to another set of documents. Take your time. So now I want to talk to you about um, what's labeled as the city's exhibit five emails to the planning board chair and to the board after the October 19th, 2023 hearing on the Banfield Road project. Are you familiar with these? I am with this email? Okay. And so I have the original email, not the original, but a copy of the email from Mr. Hewitt to all of the planning board members. Is that correct? Yes. And in that email, he attaches or embeds certain links to um, other documents? Yes. And those documents include, um, contamination cases that get mixed rulings from something called BloombergLaw.com, correct? That's the first one. And what's the second one? It's a New Hampshire Business Review link when a wire property owner is suing Portsmouth over contamination of the site. And the other? Banfield Realty sues Portsmouth, New Hampshire, claiming land is too polluted on Seacoast Online. And the last is Portsmouth Land Buyer sues settlers, 
sellers, excuse me, realtor city and claiming contamination to hidden dash from in depth New Hampshire. So now during the planning board meeting for this project that occurred in October of 2023, um, was there some discussion about the contamination at the Banfield Road property and the ongoing litigation? There was Deputy City Attorney uh, Trevor McCourt gave the planning board a presentation. And in regards to the litigation, how was the planning board advised? That all those matters were preempted by the ongoing litigation and state and federal agencies that were looking into those matters. And were they, was the litigation considered to be relevant to your decision on the application? No, it, we were told it was not. And so that um, proposal was approved in October? Yes, it was. Okay. And then this email went out on what date? It was within the appeal period, which was concerning to me. I remember that. So it's dated Monday, October 30th, after a, yes. a hearing on October 19th. And why is it concerning to you that it went out during the appeal period? Well, that's to, to address that, when a planning board makes a decision, there's a 30-day appeal period within which an aggrieved party can appeal the decision. And during that time period, you know, the record is set, the planning board's made a decision. And this is raising or attempting to raise new information to the full board. So it's, I believe, likely a violation of the right to know law and also providing information that had an issue arisen um, or made a part of the lit ongoing litigation, it could have complicated matters for the city considerably. In what way? Well, you've got a planning board member raising new things, and um, I tried to, I, I did address it in the letter I wrote to Mr. Hewitt after that. So, November 2nd, 2023. You wrote a letter to Mr. Hewitt, a different letter. Yes, I did. Okay. And is that the letter that you wrote to him? It is. And um, can you go through that letter and summarize what your concerns were and how you expressed them to Mr. Hewitt? Well, I think I've, in the interest of, uh, you know, everybody's late evening, I won't read the entire thing, but it's basically what I just said. It's the... Um, First of all, there was a concern at the beginning of the meeting as to whether or not the application should be accepted as complete. That's a specific term of art under New Hampshire statutes with an application. And it means <clears throat> that there's sufficient information for the board to invoke jurisdiction. It doesn't mean you have all the information you need. It doesn't mean you can't ask for additional studies. It doesn't mean any of those things. It just means you can start the process. You can invoke jurisdiction. So that was the first thing. I tried to explain because there was considerable discussion and not just Mr. Hewitt, one other planning board member also didn't understand that topic that evening, I believe. Um, I also addressed what I felt was kind of a cheap shot against the fellow planning board members that by raising these points, he was raising himself to a higher standard than his fellow planning board members and I don't think that's true. Um, and then I just talked about the, the appeal period that I just mentioned and the fact that this is inappropriate, I believe I said highly inappropriate for a board member to do something like this, especially while the appeal period is open. And during that appeal period, I mean literally, an appeal could be taken. Correct. Um, and could it come back to the board? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and how does that happen? How could it come back to the board? Well, there can be a motion for rehearing. It's not, that's not specifically spelled out in the statutes, but, um, as it is for the ZBA, but 
it is customary to for boards, especially in the interest of what's called judicial economy, to prevent things from tying up the courts too much, to allow a board to reconsider a decision if, a, if an applicant or an agreed party wants the board to reconsider their decision. And if there had been a motion to reconsider within that 30-day appeal period, all of the board members would have this extraneous information. Right. <clears throat> and how might that have affected your ability to sit properly as a planning board? Well, you know, it depends on what the issue was. Um, you know, the re one of the reasons that these matters are so important, we're dealing with not just my civil rights as a person or Mr. Hewitt's rights as civil rights as a person, but with the property rights of the individuals bringing their applications to the city. And that's why it has to be a fair application of the regulations that we have. I assume we'll get into it. This is another issue, concern I've had with Mr. Hewitt, that he has sometimes felt that our regulations aren't enough, that they need to be, we need to impose different standards. That, in my mind, is not appropriate. We have to look at what the city has. And if we feel something is, it doesn't work, let's work on changing it. And that when we have to work with the council to change zoning. And we're doing that. We've done it. We're, we've I've got, I worked on more of that this morning, and there'll be more of it tomorrow morning with staff. Uh, we do it all the time. You know, you learn things as you go with applications as they come forward. And uh, if the board feels, you know, it's not my decision. It's, it's a board decision to make a recommendation to council to change zoning. And then you folks consider it, obviously, uh, and, and make the final determination. But it's just... Um, it's the it's a misapplication of um, zealous interest or um, exuberance, I guess would be another way of putting it. And as a citizen, I remember before Jim was on the planning board, when I say Jim, it's Mr. Hewitt, sorry. Um, I was getting some emails from him that were addressed to council and some of them I thought had some interesting information. Some of them I thought had maybe too much information, but it was obvious this person was somebody who was out there doing some research, and I thought it was unusual, but obviously this was a person, a citizen, who was interested in bringing things to attention of public bodies, and I think he's good at that. Okay, and is that the proper role for a planning board member when you're sitting in a quasi-judicial capacity? No. Is it a proper role if you're talking about zoning ordinances or the master plan in those, in those circumstances? If you're talking about regulatory matters, um, you can have conversations and draft, you can share draft documents under the right to know law. That's permitted and actually required to be very constraining if we couldn't do that. So, um, yes, uh, if, if, for example, he thought section such and such of the parking requirements should be changed, he could propose an amendment of that sort, send it to me, discuss it with staff, put it on the agenda for the planning board to discuss, see how the discussion goes, and it might make it to council as a recommendation. That's how the process works. So I think... In the next exhibit, um, we're going to talk about oops, those planning, uh, those parking requirements. <clears throat> so, in exhibit six, are you familiar <clears throat> with some? Email correspondence from Mr. Hewitt to the Technical Advisory Committee in January of this year. Yes. Okay. And in those conversations with the Technical Advisory Committee, Mr. Hewitt is concerned um, with one particular project that's coming before the Planning Board. Is that right? Yes. And that particular project is at 581 Lafayette Road? Yes. And um, 
the concerns that Mr. Hewitt is conveying to the technical advisory committee are in regards to parking. That's one of the concerns, yes. And then some encumbrances, is that correct? The encroachment, yes, which was raised at the meeting in this room with the planning board, yes. Right. So those had been raised in your pre-application informal meeting with the applicant, is that right? The encroachment was discussed in detail, um, and the owner actually approached the dais and looked at the sketch Mr. Hewitt had prepared to show it, and I thought that was very helpful. And, uh, and I noted it to be mentioned in the record and something that had to be addressed. The parking, that did come up as something that needed to be addressed, but not in the way discussed in this email to TAC. So what is the difference and what is your concern in the email to TAC if it's already been discussed at a pre-application meeting? At the planning board, we requested the applicant provide additional support for the parking he was proposing at this project. Uh, I don't want to get into too much of the details about the specific project, but um, it's, it does involve housing and it does involve uh, parking and those two, there's an economic tension between the two, parking is expensive. so. If you don't, if you provide too much parking, it can cost you too much money. Uh, if you don't provide enough parking, where do you put the cars? So it's it's a it's a design tension, and the applicant was asked to provide information for similar projects of similar tenant mix that he has in other locations to bring that back to the board and to be prepared to discuss parking in more detail. That's a typical pre-application discussion with an applicant. This email to TAC is instructing them with the information that um, Portsmouth's current multifamily parking requirements are woefully, uh, woefully underestimate actual parking demand and suggest that the applicant produce a parking demand model different than what the regulations say. And this is an ongoing conversation you've had with Mr. Hewitt about the Parking regulations, the appropriate regulations? We've talked about parking uh, generally and both in and outside of meetings because it's a, con it's a legitimate concern of his and it's a concern of mine. It's something I've professionally consult on. So it's very site specific, it's very use specific. Uh, it's a technical, a very technical topic. And, um, but it's also a regulatory matter. And back to my earlier point, I've actually been lobbying to get parking out of the zoning regulations and into site plan where the planning board would have more discretionary authority over them because it, they are evolving. Car use is changing rather rapidly in America and the number and types of cars we're parking is changing. And so many, many other municipalities that I'm working in have taken parking out of zoning, which is the historic way to address it and put it into site plan. However, it's still in our zoning. That's much more constraining. You can't, unless you, you, you your options are to comply with it. You can see to con seek a conditional use permit under certain requirements. If you meet the conditions, you can qualify for relief, if you will, or depending on which section of the ordinance and where you are in the city, you might be able to seek a variance for parking. So it's, it's, it's complicated. And um, the idea of whether parking, our parking regulations could be more sophisticated is a good topic to, t to discuss in a regulatory format, not to direct TAC to try to do it all by themselves. So you were concerned about this email because he was directing the technical advisory committee to look at the parking regulations outside of what you had discussed at the pre-application meeting? Is that a fair summary? Yes, it's, it's you know, the, the encroachment issue we, we mentioned. He didn't have to mention that to TAC. It, it wasn't going to be forgotten. I mean, I'm a licensed land surveyor. So, you know, if nobody else remembered it, 
and I know he would, I would certainly have, because I mentioned it on the record. But the parking issue has yet to be settled, you know, and it's, there are, the two issues are related to each other. So um, I don't know how it's going to turn out. I'm not supposed to know how it's going to turn out yet. And why not? Why do you participate in, in the TAC, in the no. Technical Advisory Committee? No. And what role do they have? They provide information to you? It's actually their full title is Site Plan Review Technical Advisory Committee. So any matter that is subject to the Site Plan Review regulations, the Technical Advisory Committee provides technical input for uh, the Planning Board to consider. It's advisory. The Conservation Commission is also advisory to the Planning Board. The Conservation Commission jurisdiction is different, and I won't get into that. But <clears throat> TAC, as Attorney Sullivan explained, you know, fire and police don't typically come to Planning Board meetings. Um, Eric Eby, who's the traffic city traffic engineer, sometimes comes to Planning Board meetings, but he's always at TAC. Um, public Works on utilities are always at TAC. They sometimes but rarely come to Planning Board meetings. So the fact that TAC assembles to look at technical aspects of the project that the Planning Board won't necessarily look at in detail is, is a benefit for both the applicant and for the city. That's their role. And they make, based on their review, they give an advisory recommendation to the Planning Board. <clears throat> and in these um, representations that um, Mr. Hewitt made to TAC about parking, um, you said that that's not a settled issue, the parking requirements and what well, is this actually No, this applicant, he, he brought in this room. You know, he stood at that, his proponents stood at that podium and presented to this, the planning board in this very room, and they wanted to know what are the issues, and parking was one of those issues. It was not settled. It has not been settled yet. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what happens. Okay. So after this occurred, did you have some conversations with Mr. Hewitt about these emails and your concerns about these emails? I don't remember if I had a conversation with him about that particular email. I, I believe I did. But I don't did you meet with Mr. Hewitt here at City Hall? I have met with him more recently, yes. And did you meet with him here with the mayor? Yes. Okay. And did you discuss your concerns about these emails to the technical advisory committee? Yes, I met with him actually two days before. You're getting the sequence in my mind. Um, I met with him on a Saturday at a coffee shop downtown to discuss this. Okay. And did you convey the I same did. concerns that we've already talked about? I did. And um, did you also meet with him here at City Hall with the mayor? I, I, the Saturday meeting um, with Mr. Hewitt at the coffee shop, I explained to him that the pattern of behavior that he had exhibited for two years uh, I had been informed by you and the mayor that um, you were considering removal process steps to, you know, under I think it's 673.13. Um, and I actually asked to meet with him, to have a conversation with him before that <clears throat> process started. So that's why I was meeting with him. And I told him, I thought, because as I understand the standard, as I pointed out earlier, Doing, some, doing that which you should not do, as the Supreme Court has said, not once, not twice, but several times, to me, that accumulation of things you shouldn't do creates a situation that probably can trigger 673.13. Mr. Hugh would indicate that he understood your concerns, that those emails to TAC were inappropriate? 
and were in violation of? When we met with the mayor, he did. Okay. Okay, and that they were in violation of certain standards that the planning board members supposed to uphold, the quasi-judicial standard and the juror standard? Yes, and he apologized for it. So how did you leave that meeting with Mr. Hewitt? Which meeting? With the mayor. Well, it was a late meeting in the mayor's office upstairs, and um, my role was mostly to listen. I provided some, a few technical points that they had questions about, but very few. And I was struck by Jim saying that he felt that the proposed removal was, um, I think he said, the punishment exceeds the crime. I mean, he's concerned that the punishment exceeds the crime. And I told him maybe once or twice it wasn't a crime, but I get the point. I got his point. I understand what his, what his point was. And so I thought about it that night. <clears throat> I thought about it more in the morning. I'm an early riser, and I was thinking about it very early the next morning. And it occurred to me there might be a way for him to stay on the planning board and I proposed basically a formalization if Jim would write a, put in writing what he said to the mayor. He apologized. He acknowledged the letters that you sent him and that I sent him. He apologized for those, said he shouldn't have done those things, and he wouldn't do it again. Uh, but I knew that wouldn't be enough because he said that before. So, and I didn't know if this was even legal when I came up with this idea, but I said, okay, in my mind, if he does a letter of apology and he does an undated letter of resignation <coughs> that I would hold such that if he did something else in my discretion, I would submit the letter and this sort of process would be avoided. He would, he would waive his rights to this sort of a process. Um, I discussed that with him the next morning and he said, has the city approved this? And I said, no. I have no idea if the city will approve this. It's just something I dreamed up, and I don't even know if it's legal. But if you want me to, I will see if the city will approve it. And he said, please do. And I did. And the city did approve it? The city did approve it. Okay. And how was it left with Mr. Hewitt in order to come in and sign these documents? Yes. Um, That was on a Tuesday, and I believe the signatures had to be hap had to happen on a Thursday. Now, I will say, in Mr. Hewitt's defense, that's a pretty short time frame. But he didn't say that to me. He didn't say anything to me after that. And I don't know. I never got a. When I said it was a, I texted him and I said, you know, we're good to go. Um, but you have to go sign the document, and I, I never heard back. But did you, um, you're aware that a letter was sent or an email was sent in regards to this matter by Mr. Hewitt on January 11th? Sort of summarizing the meeting, have you seen this? Which is it? Council exhibit number? Sorry, sub. Seven. It's seven, yep. I was, this letter was delivered, I believe it was emailed, but it was also delivered when I happened to be upstairs because I was here for some other matter. Um, was this a Thursday? Is January 11th a Thursday? Yes. Yeah, I was here for the parking subcommittee meeting. Um, and I went upstairs afterwards to see if Mr. Hewitt had signed the letter. And um, I went to your office, and I saw the, a draft of the letter. The letter actually hadn't been finished. I think it must have been around noon time or something like that. Um, and this, this was delivered at that time. Okay. And in the letter, um, Mr. Hewitt um, indicates to the mayor that 
you and the mayor requested that he resign from the planning board and he respectfully asked the city to provide him with a document itemizing the reasons and evidence justifying that request. Is that an accurate statement? That's what it says, but I told him that actually at the meeting with the mayor that it was my understanding he couldn't have the findings until the night of the public hearing because that's part of the requirement of the statute. And he Meaning, also... I'm sorry to interrupt, but when, before you go on, you mean the itemization of the reasons and evidence? Right. Okay. The and, uh, reasons and evidence I would take to mean findings. Um, also, he was told by the mayor that he had two choices. One was he could resign, or the other was this process could proceed as we're doing tonight. Uh, and it was those two options that resulted in, I think, the, he said, I think the punishment exceeds the crime, which caused me to come up with the idea that I just explained. Okay. So in response to this letter, did you um, send an email to um, Mr. Hewitt on Thursday, January 11th? You know, when I got back to my computer, I did. Okay, and the substance of that email is what? It's what I had explained um, just now, but I also added in the email the third option, which I had also, I have also explained and that which you said the city approved. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and which I didn't know when I dreamed it up if it was legal, but I guess it is. Or was so at th at this point at 1 1 21 p.m. on that Thursday there was still time if he chose to do it to either have this process proceed uh, resign or take the deal that I had gotten the city to agree to did you get a response from mr. Hewitt I did for that not. email I did not have you talked to him since I haven't Just one minute, please. further questions from Mr. Chelman and I will <coughs> hand over the microphone. occurred to me do you, either of you at the table want any water or seltzers or anything during this process I would love a, a water one there but if we could provide <coughs> if things. I could if I could grab mine for a second sure. mm -hmm. thank you can you hear me with the mic yes we can mr. Eagleton Mr. Chelman, Jeremy Eggleton, I represent Jim Hewitt. I want to show you some minutes from the October 2023 planning board meeting that you discussed in which topic of discussion was, <coughs> I believe it's the Copeland property. Is that correct? Or the Banfield property? Banfield. 
Yeah, my mistake. Banfield property, correct? Uh, which part of the minutes do you want to refer to? Page two? Well, I, I'll get to the specific reference in a minute. I just want to make sure we're <laughs> oriented. So you were talking about uh, an application by an applicant at 375 Banfield Road, which involved contamination, correct? The application didn't, the site has, is contaminated. But the hearing, uh, the minutes of which are in front of you, <clears throat> if you flip to page four of the document, see the page reference on the upper right? I do. So you were at this meeting, obviously, correct? Yes, sir. And uh, do these minutes accurately reflect the substance of that meeting? They certainly contain the gist. We have the full recording, the video recording, to accompany them, but yes. Okay. Um, and uh, did not, at that meeting, extensive discussion occur concerning the Department of Environmental Services, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the extent and the nature of the uh, environmental contamination that existed on this site? Wasn't that all part of the record in this matter? <clears throat> they submitted thousands of pages of materials, and I did ask them to explain and delineate for the board what was relevant, because I felt that it was unreasonable to expect the board to have to go through thousands of pages, but I was prepared to do it a page at a time if we had to. Um, and, and you conceded, actually you explained to Attorney Hers at the bottom of page four that there was an interrelation between some of the elements of what the site is and what the board had to look for in site plan and subdivision regulations, correct? Yes. And the subsequent testimony by uh, Deputy City Attorney Trevor McCourt talked about a lawsuit in this matter, correct? You're on to page five, yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. And, <coughs> pardon me, sorry. Um, and then uh, the second full paragraph on page five, Mr. Hewitt asked about that lawsuit, and he specifically asked Attorney McCourt if the lawsuit was filed so that the judge could apportion liability between responsible parties. And Attorney McCourt said that that would be the result that the plaintiffs are looking for, and that one of those parties was the city of Portsmouth, right? Yes. And Mr. Hewitt said he believed, I'm moving down about five lines, Mr. Hewitt said he believed that issue was relevant to the board's consideration. He did not want to do anything to increase Portsmouth taxpayers' liability, and he asked, how subdividing the property could increase or decrease the liability, and Attorney McCourt responded to that, did he not? He did. Okay. And, uh, uh, excuse me. And he said it wouldn't, it wouldn't make a difference. According to Attorney McCourt, correct? Correct. And incidentally, whose decision is it? What goes into the record, whether something is relevant or not? Isn't that the board's decision? In part, but the, you know, you might want to bring something to the planning board that has no relevance to the application of the regulations. Well, in which case, I'd probably instruct the planning board to disregard what you're mentioning. That's your call, right? But as isn't chair, the, yeah, isn't the planning board empowered to determine what the relevancy is of a given piece of information with respect to the application before it? Not completely, no. No, there's, um, I'm sure you're familiar with, you know, the sovereign and how, the, you know, especially in the state of New Hampshire, the state has certain responsibilities, the federal government has certain responsibilities, and the city has certain responsibilities. And um, when there's a preemption involved, as there was here, and those things are preempted. For example, let me make it much simpler because people probably understand this more easily. Uh, if you do something near the water in New Hampshire, you need a shoreland permit from the Department of Environmental Services. 
the planning board can't make that a condition, uh, get, make, make that approval a requirement before they grant approval of a project. You know, they can only say you have to get it, but you, you can get your city approval without having it in hand yet. Sure. It's similar, it's similar to that. I understand. So uh, a planning board that says, I want this information in the record might prove to be wrong at the end of the day about the relevancy of that information, correct? That's a theoretical possibility. Keep yeah. in mind, in this instance, we're talking about the deputy city attorney specifically saying this is something that is not relevant. Well, but again, I go back to my initial question. Deputy city attorneys made a determination about the relevancy of this information, but the board itself has to make a determination about the relevancy of the information. Does it not? Well, we have to weigh what the deputy city attorney, <clears throat> and as I recall, it was also he relayed the opinion of outside counsel who was work, actively working on the litigation. So it's not not a minor opinion that we're talking about, not a you know a casual, oh, by the way, as I'm walking by, I don't think you guys should be thinking about that. This was a well-considered bit of advice we were getting. Conceded, conceded. And yet, at the end of the day, is it not the board's decision about what information should go into the record or not, right or wrong? may prove to be a mistake, but does the board not have the discretion to determine itself what belongs in an application record or not? With respect to your, what your client raised, no. And the reason that's a no is because his complaint was what constituted a completed application. A completed application is spelled out in the regulations, and the regulations don't say you have to address contamination that requires federal intervention before you, the planning board can invoke jurisdiction on a simple two-lot subdivision Well, plan. but wait, wasn't, wasn't there thousands of pages of documentation about contamination on this site that was part of the record in this matter? It was submitted sub by the applicant, right? The applicant submitted it. Okay, so the applicant submits thousands of pages of documentation about contamination on this site, which, if I recall correctly from the meeting minutes, was a danger to human health, right? That's what the minutes say. In right? part, yes. Yeah, and so the applicant submits that information as part of their application. Why can't the board consider something the applicant submitted? Because it was irrelevant. If it was irrelevant, then the applicant would have made that decision. The applicant determined no, the relevance. No, 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 me, no, sir. no, 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 I'm not, I, no, no, submitted no, this I'm disagreeing with you. And you're, what, can we? Have the, the, the witness answer the question? I'm disagreeing with you. The applicant submitted excessive information in an attempt to obfuscate what the board needed to pay attention to, in my opinion, and I challenged them on it. That's why I asked them to distill and discern for us what among those thousands of pages we had to pay attention to, and they limited it to many, many fewer pages. So what role does the board play with respect to capping contaminated site? The planning board? Mm -hmm. I don't think we have a role. Well, you say here uh, in the minutes anyway that the board has regulations that tie into capping material, correct? Uh, now you're going to have to Point me to the where you're... Page five, the paragraph beginning Mr. Hewitt, about eight lines up from the bottom, seven lines up from the bottom on the right side. Quote, Chair Chelman, see that? Yes, that deals with the grading through that capping area, not it's the minutes are a little bit misleading, but there's a question of whether the, there could be grading through the capping area. Grading we do have control over. Um, and so it, it does tie into the board's regulations, as you say, in the minutes, right? There is a partial tie-in, I don't think, in the way you're trying to imply, okay. certainly. but. So, uh, Ms. Begala, um, I'm just reading from the minutes here, asked if EPA would correct an approval of the board for the site plan with a lesser cap than was needed for full remediation. Attorney McCourt said if the site plan was approved and there was a change between that approval 
and what was dictated by DES or EPA, the applicant would have to return to ask for an amended site plan approval. So DES or EPA would pass on whether the capping uh, instructions or conditions that were imposed by this board pass muster. Is that fair to say? <clears throat> yeah, back to my point, when you place material on a site, you're going to change its grade, which will change its drainage and other features that the planning board does have jurisdiction over. So that the planning board does have jurisdiction over. <coughs> All Attorney McCourt was saying that if the EPA or the, the other agencies that do have jurisdiction over the capping itself require a change that would re result in a change to that capping material that would change the grade, which would change the drainage, they'd need a new site plan approval from the planning board. Okay. So we have jurisdiction over a, a, an element of the site but not a, over the contamination. Okay, and you had mentioned in, your, in the context of uh, Exhibit 6, the December issues, you had explained the role of the Technical Advisory Committee, and uh, you said that it provides technical input and recommendations, that it's advisory to the planning board, correct? Correct. Um, and uh, if you flip to page 6, do you remember the TAC actually requesting that the planning board require as a condition of approval of this project proof of cleanup responsibility for the site. Do you remember that? I remember that coming up. Okay. And, and that TAC had actually made that recommendation to the planning board. Mm-hmm. So Mr. Hewitt's question then about how this lawsuit was going to affect the apportionment of that cleanup responsibility bore directly on what the TAC recommended you condition this application on, right? This is a discussion at the meeting where all discussions are good discussions. Um, I'm that's asking what, that's you, what the minutes are. Sure. I'm asking you one specific question. And I'm answering you what, what you're reading from. This is where these conversations are supposed to occur. Did your professional planning staff not recommend that the board ensure that the cleanup responsibility was made a condition of approval of the planning board for this project? Ms. Begala noticed that as a recommendation. We don't have that authority. It was a recommendation. It was, you know, perhaps heartfelt, but not based on the regulations. So. Uh, the Technical Advisory uh, Committee makes the recommendation, and it's up to you whether or not you want to agree to it, correct? That's the way it works. You've got that discretion. So in the context of that discretion, in evaluating whether or not that's an appropriate condition to place on this issue, is it not important to understand the nature of the lawsuit? Whatever your decision is at the end of the day. Well, the nature of the lawsuit in terms of in broad brush, I think we were that was explained to us. The details of the lawsuit is well beyond what the planning board would be looking at. So the nature of the lawsuit was explained to you by whom? Deputy City McCourt. In what context? At the planning board meeting. Okay, so if Mr. Hewitt learned about the lawsuit, it would have been at the planning board meeting, right? In the course of his duties, correct? As a part of the planning board meeting, yes, it came up. Yeah. Uh, at what point during the meeting did the board learn that cities uh, the city attorney was recommending that the lawsuit was not under their jurisdiction. My recollection is that that's how the meeting began. But it was at the meeting, right? It was at the meeting, yes. Not before the meeting, correct? No, it was part of the public meeting. Okay. Now, you had mentioned um, that part of your issue 
with Mr. Hewitt's email to the rest of the board with the links to the various different newspaper articles about the lawsuit was that it was a violation of the right to know law. Is that true? Yes. Um, what aspect of the right to know law did it violate? It was communication to the full board outside of planning board meeting. Okay. And and do you know what portion of the right to know law that violated? I don't pretend to remember that stuff. By okay. Well, wrote. if you're making decisions about whether a given communication violates the right to know law, wouldn't it be important to understand what the right to know law says? I didn't say that. And I do understand it. I just don't remember a specific citation within the law. Okay. Well, I will read you from RSA 91A2, subsection 1, which defines what a meeting is. And it lists a whole series of things. And then it says, chance, social, or other encounter not convened for the purpose of discussing or acting upon such matters shall not constitute a meeting if no decisions are made regarding such matters. Are you familiar with that provision? You know, I think we should have read out the entire statute because that's calling out a section and it's really Sure, let's read the entire presentation. Read the entire section. Sure. <clears throat> 91A2 Meetings open to the public. 1. For the purpose of this chapter a meeting, quote means the convening of a quorum of the membership of a public body as defined in RSA 91A1A6 or the majority of the members of such public body if the rules of the body define quorum as more than a majority of its members whether in person by means of telephone or electronic communication or in any other manner such that all participating members are able to communicate with each other contemporaneously subject to the provisions set forth in RSA 91A23 for the purpose of discussing or acting upon a matter or matters over which the public body has supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power. A chance, social, or other encounter not convened for the purpose of discussing or acting upon such matters shall not constitute a meeting if no decisions are made regarding such matters. That is it in its entirety. There are some subsections that are not relevant to this issue. Now, Mr. Hewitt sent an email out to the board, sure. And if you look at the first page of this Exhibit 5 here, the email reads, Dear Chair Chelman and Planning Board members, I just wanted to follow up with some information that I hope will help explain my somewhat zealous response to this project on October 19th. As you recall, I felt the application was incomplete as the Planning Board was not provided all the information it needed to make an informed decision on behalf of the people of Portsmouth. See below and attached. And he includes the articles that council went over with you and their links to uh, the websites on which they're posted. Now, does anything in that email suggest that the board needs to make any decisions based upon that material in that electronic format? He states that he felt the application was incomplete and wasn't provided with information and it provides new information. So what do you do with that? Well, that's my question. Does that email say we need to make a decision about this? I think the better question is, does this, is this email something he shouldn't have done? Well, what you shouldn't do is sort of defined by the Right to Know Act, right? In terms of public in, communications? In part, 
but there's also the trainings we mentioned. And, you know, it's been very explicit with the Municipal Association, and all their stuff is online as well. You can go there even without doing the formal classes. Sure. It's in the Planning Board Handbook. You don't do this. Well, I'm talking about the law of the state of New Hampshire. I'm not talking mm -hmm. about the Planning Board Handbook, okay? It's based, that's based on the law of the state of New Hampshire. And would you agree with me that, according to this email, there's no decision being asked to be made by Mr. Hewitt in that email? It doesn't specifically ask for a decision, but it's providing information for what purpose while the appeal period is open. It just, it's so inappropriate, I don't even know what to do with it. But it's not a violation of the Right to Know Act, is it? I think it is. It, the violation of the Right to Know Act requires that a quorum be communicated, you just heard it, you heard me read it, mm -hmm. and that the issue be one in which a decision is asked to be made, correct? and we can disagree on the law, but he's arguing the law with this witness. Conceded. My, my question is simple, as a matter of fact. Does Mr. Hewitt request that the board make a decision based on this, this information that he's putting in the email? Not explicitly. Thank you. So going back to the content of that meeting on October 19th, um, having looked at the minutes, uh, is it fair to say that every board member who attended that meeting learned about contamination on the site? Yes. Uh, extensive DES and EPA involvement with water monitoring, surface water runoff, and actual risks to human health, I'm quoting. They heard that information, right? So that was in the packet, mostly, yes. Um, and, and, there, and the board members also learned that there was an active dispute in court about how contamination was to be cleaned up and who would pay for it, correct? Yes. So these facts were all debated and discussed in the course of the board's hearing, right? The ones you mentioned, yes. And uh, Mr. Hewitt was at this hearing, correct? Yes, he was. Did anyone ask <clears throat> Mr. Hewitt to recuse himself? from the vote on this matter? No. Did the board ask Mr. Hewitt to recuse himself from the vote? That would include anyone. Was there a vote held about recusal at all? So not with respect to Mr. Hewitt, and I don't remember anybody else. OK. At the end of the day, uh, the board approved the subdivision application, correct? Yes. By what margin? I don't recall. If I suggested to you that 8 to 1 was in favor of the subdivision application, do you recall now? I, I just don't recall. Okay. I, I won't dispute it. I just don't recall. And the uh, email that Mr. Hewitt sent around on the 30th of October, that was after he had already voted against the application, right? I think you're right. So everybody knew how he felt about that project at the time he voted not to approve it, right? Yes, he had a misunderstanding that I tried to correct with the letter that I sent to him. Several misunderstandings, actually. But Mr. Hewitt's opinion about the project was already firmly established in the public record as a planning board member. Wouldn't you agree? He voted no on the application, okay. yes. <clears throat> okay, the next issue that you spoke about was uh, this issue of 581 Lafayette Road. Uh, if you don't mind, can you explain to the council what a pre, is it a pre-submission consultation is? And I'm showing you Exhibit G, which are the minutes to the July 20th, 2023 planning board hearing. What is a preliminary consultation? It's a pre-application pre preliminary consultation. It's a non-binding discussion between the applicant and the planning board, and I think Attorney Sullivan actually explained some of this. It's um, for the purpose of discussing in 
what the applicant proposes to do on a particular site. The board provides feedback. The applicant responds. There's usually some question and answering, but it's it's non it's a non-binding discussion. It's to help give the applicant guidance on what to do as he or she comes back to the planning board. Right, because the the applicant's going to want to know before they invest all kinds of time and money in coming up with a set of plans, kind of generally what the planning board is thinking about the idea, right? Correct. Yeah. And it's a creature of statute, is it not? It is. It's allowed by New Hampshire law expressly for that purpose. Fair Correct. to say? Fair to say. Okay. So if you can flip to uh, page 7 of Exhibit G. Uh, I don't have exhibit numbers here. Is that minutes of July 20? Yes. It's uh, for your reference. It's right here. Ah, small. I need to put my glasses back on. Page 7, you said? Seven, yes. Uh, this is the minutes relating to that particular preliminary conceptual consultation, correct? Yes. Um, and this uh, conceptual consultation uh, is one of the ordinary duties of the planning board, right? Yes. It happens every time you have a meeting. You've got some kind of... Not every time, but it's regular. It's a regular right? occurrence. Thank you. Um, and so uh, this applicant, uh, Atlas Commons LLC, presented a project proposal for 581 Lafayette Road, correct? Yes. And um, did the plans that they submitted show the proposed improvements? Yes. And I think as you uh, testified in response to Attorney Morrill, um, Mr. Hewitt picked up on an issue relating to encroachment. Can you explain for the council what the encroachment issue was? The boundary line between the applicant's property and the state right away for Route 1 goes through some of the parking spaces and some of the other improvements on the site. So the parking spaces, the lighting, the curbs, some of the improvements were actually on somebody else's land according to their site plan, correct? Correct. Okay. There's so, their survey actually, but yes. Yeah, according to their survey. And so that's an issue uh, that you identified, that the board identified and said to this applicant, hey, you got to fix that before you come back to the board, right? Correct. Yeah, because you can't give approval for a site plan to a guy who wants to build a house on somebody else's land, right? That wouldn't be very proper. Right. So uh, just, as, uh, just as you could not, in this case, approve a site plan for all these parking improvements that were on state land, right? Correct. Okay. Unless there's some sort of easement or other agreement. It's got to be addressed. Sure. It's got to be addressed. And that's what Mr. Hewitt asked the applicant to do at the, at the consultation, right? He, yes. He brought it up, and it was a consensus that it had to be addressed. Okay. So uh, he acquired his knowledge about that particular issue at the July 20th meeting, right? Well, I did. I assume he did. I don't know. I mean, he's a state engineer, so it's a state road. I'm not sure if he has other information that I don't have, but um, I got it from the plan. Okay. Uh, so he might have known about it just by virtue of his knowledge and experience, right? It might be part of his work. I don't okay. know. But it definitely came up at the hearing, and he learned about it again at the hearing, right? It was definitely discussed right here in this room. Okay. And the recommendation was made to the applicant that they had to take care of the issue, right? Yes. So when Mr. Hewitt brought that problem up, that uncorrected issue that the applicant was still bringing to the TAC, that was not news to them, right? That's just what he told them in this room, right? No, TAC's different than the planning board. Well, so. I understand. I understand. But the information he was bringing to TAC and telling them, hey, we told this client, this applicant, that they needed to correct this problem. That was something the applicant already knew about, right? Yes, that came up at the planning board meeting. Yeah. So it's not new information that Mr. Hewitt was importing out of his brain somewhere, right? It's something he told the applicant to do right in this room, right? And that's where he should be mentioning it, not okay. to tack. <clears throat> so With respect to the parking issue, you testified 
in response to Attorney Morrill's questions that parking with respect to this project is, is a real issue, right? It's all, yeah, it's an issue with any site plan. Uh, but in this case, it's an unresolved issue, even now, right? Well, of course, they've only had a pre-application discussion. Okay. And um, Mr. Hewitt's request of the planning board in this case, excuse me, of TAC in this case, sorry, I'm looking for six. Mr. Hewitt's request of TAC in this case, um, I want to understand the nature of the request. What did he ask TAC to do about the parking situation? Did he tell them TAC had to reject the plan that they proposed? Go ahead and look at his email request. Well, as I said earlier, he says that Portsmouth's current multifamily parking requirements are woefully under, they woefully underestimate actual parking demand, and he suggests TAC require the applicant to produce a parking demand data for a similar size project. Right. Does he say that TAC should reject this application in any way? He's suggesting that TAC do something that's not in the regulations. Well, he's asking TAC for more information about parking demand data, right? He's asking them to require the applicant to produce information. Yep. And he's making the statement that Portsmouth's parking regu re requirements are woefully inadequate, basically. Well, but setting aside what he thinks about the parking regulations, he's actually, he's not saying, hey, you've got to decide this against these guys. He's saying, hey, make them submit some additional data for us to consider, right? Well, you can, I think you have to read two paragraphs, one after the other. First of all, he's saying the regulations aren't adequate, and then he's saying do something else that's not in the regulations. Well, but what's wrong with asking for uh, parking demand data for the project? That's exactly what we ask. That is almost exactly what we asked. We asked that the issue of parking be addressed at the planning board. So that information, that's a planning board matter. Let's come back to the planning board. Okay. Um, so ultimately, it doesn't bother you that he asked this applicant to produce adequate uh, data concerning their parking request. It bothers you that he asked TAC to try and get this information the planning before board. it got to the planning board. Is that Correct. right? The planning board already asked the applicant to provide data. And we asked that he provide data from other similar projects. Parking demand data, after saying that the Portsmouth City regulations are woefully underestimating reality, is a different matter. And it's not, you know, it's a planning board issue. And it's, it has yet to come back. It has yet to be resolved. Uh, would it be helpful for the planning board to have parking demand data for a similar size apartment complex? In, in evaluating that's, this that's issue? Sim that's similar to what we asked the applicant to do. Okay. So when, uh, during the pre-consultation process, you actually asked for this data, right? We asked for additional parking data. We didn't ask for this exact instruction. Okay. Um, and if a board member wants additional information about the project, uh, is it not appropriate to ask planning staff to produce it? There's two different things that happen within staff. There's planning staff that provide information and in packets of material for the planning board that we get every, every month. TAC is different. TAC is also city employees, but they are a different, they're technical employees from different departments that aren't planning staff. There's public works, police, fire, all the other things we talked about earlier. And they're an advisory board that recommends to the planning board and site plan applications. So there's a, there's a difference, a significant difference between the two. And you can ask through me or whoever that happens to be the chair at the time for information from staff to come to the planning board. We don't ask TAC to do certain things. We don't instruct TAC to do things. 
So um, you actually just brought up a point that you mentioned in your testimony. Um, you say that the regulations now bar uh, planning board members from asking staff directly about uh, information requests. Is that accurate? Yes. And when did that change take place? It's in the recently adopted regulation. Uh, what was the rules. date of that adoption? I'm sure you have it nearby. I think it was last month or very soon, very like recent. A couple of weeks ago, right? After more than a year of work, yes. And so, and so at the time that Mr. Hewitt was seeking information here, there was no prohibition on board members reaching out to staff for information, right? He was instructed not to do it a number of times. It wasn't in the rules. It wasn't in the rules. Got it. Uh, with respect to the materials at Exhibit 3, which was the period of March 2022, you were answering some questions from the city's attorney regarding these emails. And I wrote down a few things that you said in the context of this malfeasance that is alleged here. You said, uh, these are things referring to the links that Mr. Hewitt asked uh, the planning board about, or the planning uh, director about. These are things that you said should be brought up at a public hearing, correct? Yes. And you can't offer those things absent from the record, right? can't offer these things out. What do you mean by that? I'm, I was writing down what you said. So uh, if it's, I guess if it's not brought up at a public hearing, then it would be absent from the record. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's okay. Um, <laughs> what, uh, what did Mr. Hewitt uh, ask the planning director to do? Where, where in the packet are you in this exhibit? So if you look in the bottom right, you see one of two and two of two. You see that? I do. Way down in the bottom yep. right. Yep. Look at two of two. And then go to the top and read for me, if you would, that sentence. Would you please? Do you see that? Uh, could you please add an addendum to the March 17, 2022 planning board packet with the following West End Yards information? Okay. So wasn't he doing exactly what you suggest he should have done? The, yes, this information he's asking that it be included in the packet. Okay, and that's okay. Well, you're not, he's not supposed to do it directly to staff. That's something that- Now, right? No, then too, it wasn't in the rules, but- It wasn't in the it was, rules, got it. It was repeatedly stated we weren't supposed to do it. Uh, viewpoint. We've heard from council that viewpoint is accessible to planning board members in the same way that it's accessible to citizens who want information on viewpoint. Yes. Would you agree? I do. Okay. So Mr. Hewitt didn't have any better access to viewpoint than anybody else, right? No, as far as I know. Okay. Um, the issues surrounding 710 Middle Road, Exhibit 4 in the city's presentation. At the time that Mr. Hewitt had those communications with Mr. Hayes, was there a pending planning board decision about that matter? I think that was well before the request for extension. Yes, it was. So no, there wouldn't have been anything pending. Right. So uh, there was no planning board decision in the offing. And if a citizen, any citizen, who had an issue with an abutting project that had been issued an approval subject to certain conditions, 
wanted to ensure that the applicant was complying with those conditions, which person would they contact at City Hall to ask about that? You know, that's a good question. Um, there is a window on the planning staff. I assume you'd start there. Wouldn't it be the compliance officer? That's where it would end up, but the person from the public probably wouldn't be okay. ushered into Vincent's office to ask him. Uh, Vincent is the compliance officer, though, yes, right? Yes, he is. Okay. So he would be the guy to enforce the conditions that were imposed by the planning board, right? He's the one who checks that, yes. Okay. So somebody who wanted to enforce those conditions or at least ask what the status was might reasonably contact the compliance officer, correct? They, would, they might seek that if they knew who he was, yes. Okay. Um, and uh, is it not true that the planning board can't just command the staff member to uh, require uh, plans that aren't part of some kind of planning board decision? They can't act autonomously, right? They're not supposed to. Right. It's outside their authority, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. So a person who is doing that about a project that's his uh, butter would be uh, acting not as a planning board member, but as an individual, correct? Or irresponsibly. Okay. But he would not be acting in furtherance of his duties. Wouldn't you agree with that? No, I don't agree with that. As I said earlier, I think when a planning board member, look, the city council cannot instruct staff to do things, but I know from working with staff, if a counselor asks a question, it gets more attention than if somebody else asks a question. It's the same thing with the planning board on a lesser degree. You know, this is, uh, it's incumbent on the planning board member to make it crystal clear if they are trying to do something as a citizen that they're acting as a citizen. So uh, in Williams versus City of Dover, that's a case you mentioned, right? Yes. You remember what the general facts of that case were? Generally. What were they? A uh, the gentleman who worked for a construction company was accused of not getting a driveway permit for his employer and I forget what else, uh, a site plan for a small shed or something like that. For a greenhouse, right? Okay. The individual acting on behalf of his employer and the individual sat on the planning board, right? Yes. Reached out to the city's permitting department to argue that his employer wasn't entitled or wasn't required to do the site plan regulation, right? I don't remember that detail. Okay. Um, well, I will tell you, I will quote from the case here, that the Supreme Court of our state found that that kind of contact was not malfeasance. Why? Because absent a direct relationship with the employee, excuse me, with the planning board members' duties, it was an error to order his removal from office for malfeasance. So the allegation that you're making or that the city's making here is really very similar to that. Mm, the Supreme Court has found. No, there are a number of distinctions. Factually, how is this distinct? Well, we're talking here about a, a pattern of behavior. Now, keep in mind, when this, the first letter I wrote to Mr. Hewitt, I wasn't seeking to remove him. I was cautioning him that he was doing things he shouldn't be doing, and that if he kept doing it, he would probably cross that threshold in the very case you just cited. Very different than what that gentleman did with the driveway and a greenhouse. Well, I guess the council will make that decision. We both view that very differently. Um, now, lastly, with respect to Mr. Hewitt's letter to you on January 11th, 2024, where he asked for an itemization of the evidence that uh, would suggest that he should be removed or that would compel him to uh, 
uh, stepped down from the seat. Um, you said he couldn't have that itemization until the time of the hearing? That was my understanding of the statute, yes. I see. So you sat down with Mr. Hewitt in a room with the mayor, and you wouldn't tell him what it was he had done wrong. And you no. told him he could, I hold on. No. You could no. either retire, step down, or we would remove you. And when he said, well, why would you be removing me? What's the evidence? You said, we're not going to show you? No, no, that's not what happened. Okay. What happened? I said, the list of charges, I think, was how he characterize it that evening are something that won't be produced until after the hearing because that's when the findings are supposed to be prepared by the council. I said what the concerns are are enumerated in my letters to you and the letters that the city attorneys have sent to you. If you read those, that's what you need to rely on. Okay, and sir, so your alternative was to have him execute a resignation letter that you would hold on to to sort of keep him on a leash, is that right? To prevent him from going outside the bounds that you've set, is that right? Not exactly. I was faced with a situation of having the city basically having made a determination. And if we can back up, when you were characterizing the meeting with the mayor, you said we asked for his retirement. I didn't ask for anything. I was there to listen primarily and to try to answer some questions. The, um, Can I interrupt briefly, and I'll let you finish that. Okay. Who asked for his retirement? The mayor told him that they were pre prepared to proceed with removal proceedings, or he could resign. So the mayor wanted him out? The mayor said he had crossed the line for malfeasance. Was that not the mayor prejudging the matter? I he had had it. Hmm. Does the mayor need to recuse himself from this matter? Do we answer questions that are posed to us at this point? Then I would move that the mayor recuse himself from this matter. So um, may I ask a question of Mr. Hewitt? Or Mr. Uh, Chillen? Hey, feel free. In the meeting, uh, did I uh, state anything other than we were prepared to move forward uh, with this proceeding and that we would decide as nine, uh, nine city councilors based on this hearing or he could remove himself? That's, that's exactly what you said, actually. Uh, yes. So, and that's fine. But this is a question. I, mis I misspoke. I misspoke. Uh, that's, that's my I understand. I understand. Having heard what I've heard, though, I still put the question to the city council as to whether the mayor should be sitting on this case. Okay. And that is a question for the mayor, as we know from the statute, for the mayor himself to determine. I'd say the, the mayor did not prejudge it. He said, based on the facts, that I hear, um, if you don't resign, the next step is it should go to the council for a full hearing. So I understand that, but I'm asking the mayor to make that statement on the record that he has not prejudged this case. I have not prejudged this case. Yeah. I welcome any opportunity uh, to listen. Any involvement that I've had uh, with this has been an effort to find alternative resolution to this case. Uh, as well as, um, yeah, to find alternative resolution to the case. Thank you. <coughs> That's all the questions I have for Mr. Tillman. I don't have any further questions. Does the council have any questions? Councilor Tabor. Thanks, Your Honor. Um, <clears throat> Thanks for serving on the planning board, Rick, and chairing it and, uh, and your good work. In the case of the instructions to the TAC, um, you said that the planning board had agreed with the applicant to get comparable projects the applicant had done. Yes. And then 
Mr. Hewitt's instructing the TAC to go a step further and do a traffic study similar to what was done by Torrington at West End. Um, and, and said the city parking regs are totally inadequate uh, and asked for a whole new set of data. Um, if the applicant, if, if a majority of the planning board then took that up, wouldn't that be kind of a, a sudden surprise to the applicant, uh, particularly coming from something circulated um, that was not part of the public record. Well, just so because this is an important record, you said traffic study at the beginning of your question, Councillor Tabor. Parking. It would be a parking. It would be a parking. Parking. Study. Yes. Um, My mistake. No, I, I just just for clarification. <clears throat> that's all. Um, it's. I'm, I'm back to where I was. It's it's just something that's not done. You don't instruct TAC on what to do. Um, they do their thing. The planning board does its thing. And uh, if if TAC came up with something not contained within the Portsmouth regulations, I think the applicant could have a valid concern with that. So. Um, you know, and then if that came as a recommendation to the planning board, I, I would have a concern with some, a recommendation outside the regulations, much like a recommendation outside deputy city attorney's uh, advice on the other matter. So uh, it would be one of those confusing things. What, what do you do with it? It, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't have arisen. I don't know if I helped answer that question. But. Well, I think you've clarified that um, you'd be asking, TAC would have been asking the applicant something beyond the regulations that exist in Portsmouth around parking. Correct. And um, that answers my question. Okay. Assistant Mayor, then Councilor Cook. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chairman. I just have a a question um, that relates to the email sent around 710 Middle Street. Uh, the email dated June 23rd, 2022, um, mentions uh, the need, the potential need for an extension on that project. Um, as someone who doesn't specifically follow the planning uh, process, could you explain why um, Mr. Hewitt may have brought, brought that up to the former planning director? Approvals have a time limit <clears throat> within which you have to get a building permit and proceed with the actual project. Um, I, I should remember, I don't remember offhand, I think it's a year or two, some, some it's a year, some it's two years. And because there had been litigation, uh, the applicant was prevented from proceeding and the time limit was running, had run out or was about to run out and I think he raised the question because what, what was the, the intervening litigation? Did that toll the deadline of the time frame? How does that work? So I think, I think, I don't have that email in front of me, but I think that's, as I recall it, that's the context of that question. Um, another question. So considering that a, an extension would have been needed or was issued, um, Mr. Hewitt, was on the board when that application came forward or would have been on the sitting on the for board for the extension that, yes for the extension okay thank you councilor cook uh, thank you your honor and thank you chair Shellman. Um, i have a general question about email and emailing to other boards if you're sitting on the planning board is there ever a time when it's appropriate for a planning board member to email the entirety of the TAC or the entirety of the Conservation Commission or for that matter the entirety of the Planning Board? The first two, I can't think of a situation where it would be appropriate. The, the last, only when discussing things like um, regulatory amendments, uh, legislative matters they're called, where uh, draft documents, you can circulate draft documents for discussion it's, it's very limited. It has nothing to do with applicants, has nothing to do with 
people's property. It's just rules and regulations or perhaps recommendations that we're going to make to council. As a follow on to that, um, if a member of the planning board were to email all of the TAC or all of the conservation commission, is there a chance to introduce bias into their deliberations? Well, depending on what, yes. I mean, that's why you're not supposed to do it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Moreau, then Councillor Bagley. <clears throat> Mr. Chalman, if my memory serves me right, as the City Council Rep on Planning Board, I believe prior to passing our new rules in January 2024, there was actually at one of our public meetings um, that you did state to all Planning Board members the request that anything mm -hmm. to, as requested to be requested by staff go through you. Because I remember us having a discussion on that. Is that true? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, it's been more than once because I've been reminded by staff. I just wanted to make yes. sure I had remembered that correctly. So it really was made part of the rules before it was officially adopted. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Honor. Can I ask a clarifying question um, of Attorney Eccleston? Certainly. Um, there was a lot of discussion about Section 91A colon 2 um, regarding the email that was sent to the uh, entirety of the planning board. And you mentioned a chance social or other encounter not convened for the purpose of discussing or acting upon such matters shall not constitute a meeting if no decisions are made regarding such matters. And my question to you is, Are you is your contention that an email to a quorum of the planning board was a chance? No, it's, it falls under the other aspect of that sentence. Well, wouldn't electronic communication and email be the same thing? Um, the sentence that you read and which I referred to would be an exemption from the broader prohibition on the use of electronic communication as a ersatz meeting, in effect. So the goal. I'm sorry, what was that word, ersatz? Yes. I don't a, know the definition of that. A replacement sorry. meeting as something that's okay. not a meeting. Um, and the statute actually specifically addresses the role of electronic communication with respect to meetings and what it says about uh, that electronic communication is you can't use it to avoid the spirit and intent of the statute. So they don't want planning board members through cyclical communications by email, replying all and so forth, in effect to hold a meeting, discuss and deliberate an issue, and then make a decision, because that is a meeting. That would definitely be a meeting under the statute. Okay, and it, maybe I'm reading this under a little incorrect, but it says uh, discussion or decision. Excuse me. It says discussion or decision, but Correct. it sounds like you're contending that decision must be part of it. The decision has to be part of it for it to be a meeting. Absolutely. So it can't just be for discussion purposes. No, and this is where this is my issue with a lot of these bald assertions about what the right to know law requires in this state. So there is no question that these communications are public. And we don't have a problem with that. So if the city of Portsmouth doesn't like these communications being public, that's the city of Portsmouth's issue. These communications are definitely publicly available materials. They're public records. But they are not public meetings unless there's a discussion and deliberation. Or there's a, a request for a decision to be made in that context. And council may disagree with me. But that's my read of this law. Can I ask Attorney uh, Laughlin a question? It is, in my mind, and I'm by no means an attorney, if I say, if I read uh, discuss, uh, decision or discussion, it sounds to me that either one would qualify. And if it said discuss, uh, dis decision and discussion, it would require both. But the statute says or. So could you enlighten me as to what your interpretation is? I'm the first interpretation you just mentioned is what I, I understood the law to be. And which which one did I say <laughs> first? <laughs> it's getting late. Um, <clears throat> that that the, um, I haven't got the wording right in front of me, but the R um, made them that that was caused the problem. Uh, not I, I don't separate it the way that uh, Attorney Eagleton. Does. Great, thank you going to provide my interpretation, but I, Thank I, you. it's in my memo of law anyway. Are there further questions of the council? I guess I have 
one for, or maybe two for Mr. Uh, Chilman. Thank you for uh, your work as chair of the planning board. Um, if this information is provided, would it be general knowledge? I guess is the is the appeal window general knowledge of a planning board member and information provided in that uh, appeal window is that considered new information with is that general window the 30 days a a general knowledge no I I take the position I'm sure there are people in the room who would disagree with me that the planning board a planning board member should not be sending an email to the planning board members bringing up new information during the appeal period. If the planning board member feels there is new information that should be considered, they, may, they can request another meeting. We have the ability to call another okay. meeting to consider something, but uh, I wouldn't circulate, and, and something shouldn't be circulated, just uh, as the way it was, in my opinion. Um, and then um, I guess this uh, would pr probably be a question also for Mr. Hewitt, but um, reading this just sounded, as you recall, I felt the application was, inc was incomplete as the planning board was not provided all the information it needed to make an informed decision on, the, on behalf of the people of Portsmouth, see below and attached. Is it your belief that was this information of the Bloomberg law the, or the four links, was that presented at the planning board? Or is that presented, or was that outside of the, the planning board and not presented to the planning board? I didn't click on all those links, but I don't recall anything about from Bloomberg Law. Um, you know, we had a presentation by the deputy city attorney, and he explained the outstanding litigation, and then we had uh, the explanations from the applicants, engineers, and other people explaining more about the site details. But... Um, you know, I, I didn't want, I didn't feel it was appropriate to open those links. You know? Would it have been um, at the planning board meeting, um, if he had had prior knowledge of these links, would it have been through some course available to him to ask questions on this in the public record? That could have been appropriate. But, you know, we're back to the how much research does a planning board member do on their own. Um, the Internet can be a wonderful and a dangerous thing, depending on what you're doing with it. And if, if, if you found a concern over uh, some element that had recently been discovered in another part of, you know, uh, Kryptonium or something that I'm, I'm making up, uh, that has just been discovered and causes this kind of a problem that hadn't been identified before, you would ask the applicant, have you studied Kryptonium? We should have you consider that, whether you've got any on your site, perhaps, um, and report that to the DES. <coughs> I don't know. You know, that's, that's how that sort of thing might come up. Thank you, Chairman. Your Honor. Uh, Sister Mayor. Thank you. Um, this is for Attorney um, Edel, um, sorry. Eggleston. Eggleston. And I'm just trying to get um, a little bit of clarification on um, your, your and uh, Mr. Hewitt's um, understanding of the statute and the right and right to know. Mm -hmm. So are you stating that, or uh, I guess a, a question is, if someone would have replied, would that then have considered this a quorum in a meeting? So I think uh, if the depends on the nature of the reply. Mm -hmm. So so I guess um, an example of, um, okay, so go ahead. Yeah, so if someone said thanks, appreciate it, I wouldn't call that discussion or decision. If someone said uh, thanks, I appreciate that, what do you think this means in terms of the application? And Mr. Hewitt were to respond, well, I think it means this, then sure, that starts to get into the territory where you're holding a deliberation that should be public knowledge. But where someone just sends an email and says, heads up, uh, I would like this material to be part of our record at the meeting next month, that is not a discussion and it's not a decision. And he's not requesting either one. Okay. Thank you. 
Any further questions? Thank you, Chairman Chairman. Thank Excuse. you. Your Honor, I, I would, um, I believe we are past 1030. <laughs> yeah, so I guess we have a question of you. Do you have any further witnesses? No, and I, and like to excuse Mr. Chelman first before we get sure, into yep, any you're excused, yep. That's okay, thank you. Um, I do not, um, but I understand Mr. Eggleton does have um, two witnesses. I do, uh, and I put it to the board, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Hewitt will be on the stand for some time. Uh, it's a late night. I sit myself on the Hanover Planning Board, Zoning Board of Adjustment. I get how hard it is to be up late dealing with these issues. Neither I nor Mr. Hewitt wants the board making a decision at one o'clock in the morning on these issues. So, uh, you know, I put it to you and I put it to council to suggest what we should do at this point. So I would ask, um, since this is um, concerning uh, Mr. Hewitt, um, if you would like an extension uh, to better um, serve your uh, your case and you believe that would be uh, a better use or a better opportunity for us uh, we can agree upon uh, that time if you think that it's going to be like three hours is going to be significant uh, so it'd be a defer I guess I would I have a scheduling problem in that I will be out of the country next week so it would we'd need to finish up this week if we're going to postpone how would we do this Kelly just a quick question in terms of if we were to postpone to tomorrow yeah. well if we postpone that that's if we adjourn continue. to tomorrow is that continue? does that require continue. If we continue, continue to continue. tomorrow would that provide that would that re would it's that require one to three inches it's not a snowstorm they don't expect this we're not canceling uh, trash pickup um, would we expect we we have to notice it i guess is my question if we if, if we continue tomorrow no because we're continuing it so it's already been noticed and if the board takes the motion to continue that then that's okay are there any other um are there any other scheduled hearings tomorrow night i, in, in? I would i i don't know without the calendar in front of me there's hgc tomorrow night in this room your honor Valand, I think. It's conference room A. There's, there, there's conference room A. There's two boards in here. School boards in here tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, Your Honor, is there a possibility of Thursday? Planning board. Planning board in here. I was like, I know that one. How about Wednesday? <laughs> Wednesday's tough. No. Well, I understand that, um, and we're we're working to make sure that all of the facts are presented. It's always a balance of when we choose to have uh, folks uh, folks present uh, or uh, speak. Um, we want to make sure that we're able to provide. Uh, the ability for Mr. Hewitt to present his case uh, before the public speaks. Have, you have we found we're not having much luck finding a time um, unless you want to do something on Friday? Um, we do have the HDC and the school board. Um, HTC's in conference room A. HTC's in conference room A. Um, Board's supposed to be in here, yeah. We have no. Uh, uh, and we shut down Wednesday. No I guess we shut down. I guess Wednesday is Valentine's Day, but um, that's fine with me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's amateur hour for, for going out to dinner. Yeah. You're going to need a lawyer. Oh. <laughs> Um, we is can, tomorrow is, uh, Wednesday is fine if you want to have, do we have to have the school board meet somewhere yeah. else, is that? Okay. The school board meet in 14th has, 
Yeah. The school board Wednesday meeting is at two thirty in the afternoon. Yeah, there's, yeah nothing. there's nothing here, so the we could do that Wednesday evening. Wednesday evening. Okay with you. The here at four. Okay, they'll Starting be done. At the school board is here tomorrow, and then they're and then they're here Wednesday as well. We're not looking at uh, conservation commission four p.m. on Wednesday. And what's here tomorrow? School board. Okay. One to three inches shouldn't scare anyone away. Which do you see is here? Okay. School board can also. No, they're in the conversation. Okay. Okay. So Wednesday is when we're going to. I won't be able to make it. Okay. Tuesday. I won't be able to make it. I have my Valentine's tomorrow. My husband works Wednesday night. Okay. Um, Friday. His opinion. Um, if there's a day that he feels. Uh, Mr. Hewitt, is there a date that you would prefer to? I'm completely open any time. Everyone's saying no. We've got a lot of romantics here. Um, so. Friday is open. Looks like, yeah, there's nothing on the calendar at all on Friday. Or we power through. Daytime meeting. Um, Try day to, you can do it during the day. Friday, Friday works for me. The, the city hall closes at 1 on Friday, but. Is there any uh, afternoon? Is there any uh, ability to have it in the afternoon on Friday? On this side, yes. Okay. Um, would there be any um, opposition by uh, Mr. Hewitt or his counsel for having the public hearing uh, portion of the meeting before you present your case? Tonight. Tonight. Uh, we, we would not oppose that. If, if the public wants to speak tonight to conclude to this evening, that's fine with us. Okay. And, and then, then we, we will continue on rejoin your, on as Friday. long as you are okay with uh, that order of the events. Attorney Walkman, do you? Okay. So, um, do we have a, have we figured out when we're going to have? What time on Friday? Yeah. Because I have some closings that day. <laughs> some of us have obligations professionally. And I appreciate everyone's flexibility very much. We appreciate yours. So I just want to clarify: we are we are saying no to, and we'll go through since we've we've figured out the that we'll have public comment before um, the rest of the proceedings. We'll do that this evening. Everybody's out to listen to at least half of the case. Um, uh, but Tuesday. Uh, that's out because of school board in this room or HDC in this room? School board in this room and HDC. We there. could ask them to. Can we ask the them. school board to move and, yes. can, and have. Um, City Council has precedent to okay. this room. So we will continue this. Uh, is tomorrow night out because of. Okay. I'm, it's just a financial so loss. It's, no way to it's, the state. New England. it's New England, one to three inches. No, okay. I have dinner tomorrow. The, tomorrow night's my Valentine's Day, my anniversary. It's okay. Um, <laughs> so is the, <laughs> and Wednesday's <laughs> out for other people? Okay, so that's why we're at Friday. Who's Wednesday out for? Um, Anyone, people up here, Wednesday's out? Wednesday's not, is, it's out I, for. I won't be able to attend. Sounds like Friday. Okay, so we're back to we're back to Friday, and we're doing it in the afternoon, if possible. If I'm just we're out of time, I'll tell Fridays you. can be challenging in the afternoon. Friday is going to be challenging. Can can you got to pick one Wednesday or Friday? Yeah, you got to pick one. Which, which is worse? Wednesday I have plans. Fridays are up in the air. Speak up on that, Mayor. Or not, I'm not looking to, just to be clear, I'm, I'm looking at where everybody can can afford Mr. Hewitt the, the right to defend uh, himself. I'm, you know, I am free. Maybe out of order, and I, I'm only trying to understand, I understand it's 11 o'clock at night, and yep. I can understand the request, but who is going to provide testimony, which is the issue, which he said 
really start to understand for a long time. I wouldn't want to make comments tonight before I heard that testimony. So I didn't understand why you were going to hear us at a Well, I had, I had, okay, I had asked that um, before um, or mentioned that before when uh, we were, you know, issue people may want to uh, speak this evening, might have other plans uh, in future events. It seems as though, um, you know, we're splitting the, the difference here. Um, Tuesday, um, Please, when, so, but you, Councillor Bagley, you're out on Wednesday? Yes. Okay, for what? Okay. Um, to Thursday. <laughs> it's a special event. Um, Your Honor, I'm trying to cancel my that. That's mm. okay. We're going to do Tuesday. We're going to Tuesday. reschedule the rest of the hearing until Tuesday. Tomorrow. 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 Tomorrow, Tomorrow. Tomorrow at six p.m. In this. It's going to snow in the morning. It's going to be done by. Like We're not morning. expecting an enormous amount of snow tomorrow. We're going to postpone the rest of the hearing till tomorrow at 6 p.m. I'd wait a motion to postpone. So moved. Continue. Second. To continue. I'd, wait a mo I'd wait a motion to continue. <laughs> I move we so continue moved. to tomorrow at 6. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you so much. Well.